Speed, speed record for Jeff Bodine, better than 176 miles an hour. And the pole position for today's Atlanta 500 in NASCAR's Winston Cup Series. The man who has won two of three races this year, Neil Bonnet, starts 31st today. That is way back. Jack Aroot now with Neil Bonnet. And Keith, Neil Bonnet has started back as far as 30th. In fact, two weeks ago in his last victory, he came from 30th position. Today, it's 31. Can you make it another victory from back here? I tell you, Jackie, two weeks ago, we pulled it off. We certainly got our work cut out for us today. What a dramatic turnaround for this team this year. What do you attribute that to, Neil? I tell you, a lot of hard work went into the effort with the car, and we had some good racing luck in turn. We've been running good. Maybe it'll continue today. Well, for it to continue, he's going to have to work extra hard coming from the back of the pack, Keith. All right, Jack, this racetrack is rated third fastest of the super speedways. NASCAR's big boys are ready to put the hammer down today in the Atlanta 500. And you walk through the parking lots in the infield, you find license plates from all over the south, reaching as far north as Pennsylvania, New York, and Michigan. The good old boys don't all have a southern drawl anymore. This is an automobile racing group that has a national following. And when Bill France Sr. founded NASCAR and started him racing on the beach some 40 years ago, the rules were probably on a napkin or a paper sack. But through the years, the innovative people, the backyard engineers, have created engines and chassis that nobody could have dreamed of, including putting restrictor plates on carburetors out of necessity because they were going too fast on the two and a half mile super speedways. So, they slowed them down at Talladega and Daytona, but today in Atlanta on a mile and a half super speedway, there are no plates. All the horsepower is back, and as the engines will be fired up gentlemen, along pit road, you'll hear the rumble words, and the roar. Long awaited. The general sales and marketing manager of Ford Parts and Service Division. These engines Dearborn, blowing Michigan, out five, six hundred horsepower, Miskowski. 160 miles an hour. You Gentle can spin your tires coming down off a turn. Your engines. Listen to this grumble. Or growl if you prefer. Tires have been part of the story as well. A challenger for Goodyear, first one since 1971, called Hoosier Tires. Let's follow the story with Jack Aroot. And Keith, Hoosier is an upstart tire company that devotes their tire technology solely to the racing community. They came on board this year, and they've scored two victories. In fact, the last two on the Winston Cup circuit. Goodyear, though, not to be outdone, came down here and tested last Friday and Saturday. With what they learned, they went back to Akron, Ohio, developed a tire, and built 1,100 of them, brought them in here. And so good is this Goodyear tire that 40 of the 42 in the starting field today have elected to start with them. Here's the problem, though. A lot of the teams aren't convinced that they'll go just as good as the Hoosiers in the long run. So they've mounted both sets, and we'll keep you abreast of who switches to what. And a case in point to remember, too, is that it took 8,000 man hours to develop this Goodyear tire. Now, for more information on what's shaken down here in the pits, let's go to my colleague, Jerry Gappins. Jerry? Well, after rain washed all Friday's practice out, the weatherman's finally cooperated here in Atlanta. Ideal day, in fact. 65 degrees, westerly winds at 12 miles per hour. Won't have an effect of anything in the turns. In fact, the engine builders like it. It's ideal atmospheric pressure for those engines, and the drivers should like it well because it's going to be very comfortable in the cars today. The only thing they have a question mark about right now is the fact that lack of practice might have a determination whether the car is going to be handling well right now at the start of this race, and that's something we'll see very soon, Keith Jackson. All right, those are the guys who will be doing the heavy, dirty work today down on Pitt Road. Sitting up here in his boiled shirt with me, Dr. Jerry Punch. Yep, practicing physician. That's why we call him doctor. But he's a man who loves this sport. He's a man who's worked with us many, many times out along Pitt Road and for other people as well. So with his expertise at my side, I think I'm in for a fun afternoon. And Dr. Punch, let me start with this. Some of the big boys who have been so dominant over the last three or four years have not shown up so far this year. They've hit a bump in the road. What's happened? Well, Keith, noticeably absent from Victory Lane early this year are people like Dale Earnhardt and Bill Elliott. These two drivers have dominated this Winston Cup Tour the past three years. But in the first three events, only one of those two drivers, and that's Dale Earnhardt, has a top five finish. You know, I talked to Bill Elliott earlier this morning. He said, you know, there's an old Georgia saying that if you can't run with the big dogs, you best stay under the porch. Well, he's been under the porch for three races. He said, but today I climb out and I'm going to yell. Why have people like Earnhardt and Elliott uh, been so quiet? 
Well, I think the restrictor plate kept Elliott quiet at Daytona, where he's been so strong for so many years. And the Hoosier tires on Neil Bonnet's car at Richmond and Rockingham kept everyone quiet because Bonnet was just so dominant there. Young Bulls now. You got one of them way back. Number 41 position on the starting grid, uh, Davey Allison. Davey Allison is a strong contender. That car will be up in the front. And I talked to Davey. I said, you know, are you concerned about starting 41st? He said, Jerry, if I can't get to the front in three and a half hours, I don't deserve to be there. Well, he's probably right. But he uh, got into a bit of a pickle with some engines because the engines that they had brought from the garage were not totally acceptable. And so he had to run what the crew called the mule. But he probably will be there because he does have some talent. Now let's run down the starting grid for you as they get ready to move off pit road. Starting on the pole with a new track record, Jeff Bodine. 176.6 miles per hour. Outside front row, here's the guy that was so tough last year, Dale Earnhardt. Number nine, that's Bill Elliott. He's inside row number two. Alongside Rusty Wallace, another young charger who many think could win here today. Inside number three, it is uh, car number 15, Brett Bodine and A.J. A.J. Ford raced at Sebring last night, back up here today. Mark Martin is inside on row four alongside the veteran Benny Parsons. In row number five, Ken Schrader, another of the young lions looking to go to victory circle. Alongside Darrell Waltrip, who has had a very long dry spell. Hasn't won on an oval super speedway since 1985. Here's the rest of the field now. Row six, Alan Kulwicki there with uh, Marlon will have a live ABC camera in his car. The body and speed, row seven. Looking down through the rest of them, rows eight and nine. There you see Phil Parsons, younger brother of Benny. A couple of veterans, Gant and Baker in row nine. Row 10, Cale Yarborough and Morgan Shepard. 11, you've got Kyle Petty and Bobby Hillen, a couple of the young ones. Row 12, you've got Beer Schwale and Richard Petty, father of Kyle. Nuff Singer and Combs, Brad and Rodney in 13. 14, it's Bobby Allison, another veteran that's way back there, but he'll move it up. Ricky Rudd as well. David Sospi and Ken Reagan in 15. 16, Neil Bonnet, Rick Wilson, Dave Marcus, Ernie Urban in row 17. 18, it is Brad Teague and Derek Cope, H.B. Bailey and Jim Sauter in 19, row 20. Jimmy Means, Dale Jarrett, row 21, Davey Allison, and Ken Bouchard. As the cars roll out, you've got 11 Fords, 9 Chevys, 9 Olds, 7 Pontiacs, 6 Buicks, and you see 40 cars start on Goodyear, but they can change if they so choose later. Breakdown, 42 starters, awards posted, more than a half million, 328 laps for the 500 miles, a race record held by Benny Parsons. Let's take a look at this mile and a half true oval with Dr. Jerry Punch. Well, they call it the Big A, Keith, the world's only true super speedway oval. There are tri-ovals and quad-ovals, but this is a pure circle, an oval track, 1.522 miles, and it's a unique layout. The corners are a half a mile each. The straightaway is only a quarter mile. So you spend the majority of your time in the banking here at Atlanta. The banking is 24 degrees. The track is only about 50 feet wide, so it's very, very difficult to pass anywhere here. That's why it makes this track so treacherous. Those exits on the screen, the right exit turn two, where a lot of activities happen, and the left one over in turn four, where all the action happened last year. There's the picture from our live ABC camera in Alan Kulwicki's car. And uh, we told you there is another one back in Neil Bonnet's car. And when you're starting 31st and you're kind of the craftsman that Bonnet is, we think we'll have a lot of fun watching that camera today because you know that Bonnet is going to try slowly but certainly to work his way toward the front. And I suspect he probably will. We're told we have one lap to green. It was so cold here over the last uh, couple of days that uh, we thought they might have to run them for quite a while to get them warm, but it's up to 65 degrees. Harold Kinder is the flag man, and Harold takes uh, his orders from those people right there in NASCAR race control. And Keith, if you believe in history, I think the brothers Bodine have to be in pretty good shape today. In this racetrack in the last 28 years, the 56 races that have been run here, the preferred starting spot has been either first or fifth. Ten times the pole sitter has won the race, and ten times the fifth fastest qualifier has won it. If you look at the grid, Jeff Bodine starts first, and his younger brother Brett starts fifth. It'll be very easy for you at home uh, to pick up the leader early on because Dale Earnhardt is in that black car to the left of your picture now. And the bright yellow and white, that's Jeff Bodine. And right behind Bodine is Bill Elliott. And I just, for all 
the world can't believe that you're going to keep Bill Elliott very quiet. Temple, the nation's number one team, John Cheney's Owls, making their case, aren't they? They handle Georgetown apparently with some ease. That's a final score. You see that Atlanta is rated third among the so-called super speedways. You can sit and argue for a week about what constitutes a super speedway. You know that uh, the two big ones, Talladega and Daytona, at two and a half miles uh, are the obvious ones, but uh, there are many others that are considered super speedway because of the speed that one is able to attain on them. Beautiful day, very light covering of clouds on the horizon, harsh, cold, bitter wind and rain on Friday, and it stole all of the practice time away from them, limiting their practice time, obviously, and because they were able to practice late yesterday after having qualified in the middle of the morning. Bodine, who won the pole position, got out early on among the qualifiers and put a number on the boards at 1766 that nobody could really touch. So now I think Mr. Kinder has the green in his hand, and as they come down, the pace car should peel out of there, and we're going to have a run and start. This can be a very, very exciting racetrack. Pace cars off. Holding positions. down low. Wallace is up high. Wallace 27, Elliott 9. And yeah, that is a tough way to run your first lap on a narrow racetrack. That's the way they did it. And they are flat flying. Bill Elliott can't get the outside groove and he is shuffled to the inside. But Earnhardt, meanwhile, has caught Jeff Bodine and he is going to try to go to the point. Allison in that first lap. We told you he was back in the number 41 position. In the first lap, Baby Allison passed seven cars. Car number 28. He's the younger, the son of Bobby, the youngest of the Allison drivers. And here goes Earnhardt in the black car. Bodine high. Earnhardt low. Takes the lead. Earnhardt has the uncanny ability to get a car out of shape and hang on to it. In the last four races here at Atlanta, he has led the most laps in three of them. So he is no stranger to leading here at this racetrack. Incidentally, as they come by, we want to place A.J. Foyt for you because A.J. has had a very busy weekend. He was the first car on the track to qualify yesterday. where he qualified, but Dale Earnhardt took that black car number 14, it's black and red, took it out yesterday and uh, just to see if there were any worms in it, keep it in shape for AJ as a favor. And Earnhardt came in and said, if you loosen this thing up a little bit, I'll take a second off the track record. That thing is flying. Well, AJ doesn't like a loose car. He wants that thing tight and snug. That tends to reduce some of your speed. Gordon's sitting right there at number six. Those front six cars now. There's Earnhardt and uh, Jeff Bodine, about four or five car lengths behind him. But you mentioned A.J. Foyt, Keith. A.J. had his best qualifying run ever. And there's the top four cars. Elliott, the car in the far right of your screen, moving in on Rusty Wallace. But A.J. has not had a good finish in NASCAR for a couple of years. His best finish is fifth back in 1985 at Talladega. His only start this year was at Daytona, and he had a lot of trouble there. And Keith, at 53 years of age, this man is going to try to run 14 hours of racing, actually 16 hours of racing, in the last 24. Yeah, but he, he's harder to find stump, you know. He, he keeps himself in shape, and uh, he's he is a very young 53. Davey Allison, meantime, in car number 28, continues to move up through the field, picking him off and picking him off. He's going right by Neil Bonnet right now. There he goes. All Neil can do is just wave goodbye. Car number 28. We'll keep an eye on This is Davey's favorite race car. Won four 
of his five pole positions in this race car. He also won a race at Dover, Delaware. It's a car that's old, but a car that will run awfully quick for it. Allison has now moved up 12 positions, started 41, now running 29th. This ABC Sports Exclusive, the Atlanta 500, being brought to you by a Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. No matter how far you go, Goodyear takes you home. By Tanya Computers, there's no better value. By Quaker Street, and quality. Always have, always will. And by Budweiser, proud sponsor of the 1988 U.S. Olympic team. This Bud's for you. Dale Earnhardt, Jeff Bodine, Rusty Wallace, Bill Elliott, Brett Bodine, Money Warner, Curly, and Live from ABC Sports, the running order, Dale Earnhardt, Jeff Bodine, that's your front row. Rusty Wallace, Bill Elliott, dropping the fourth, Brett Bodine, five, A.J. Ford, six, Benny Parsons, Darrell Waltrip, Sterling Marlin, and Martin Martin. We've got two cars out, number 52, Jimmy Means, behind the wall, and car number 31, that is Brad T. They were the first casualties. So you've got 40 running. Davey Allison right now has moved up to the 24th position, so he's improved himself 17 spots. Here's Jerry Gappins in the pits. We're with Richard Childress, the team owner for Dale Earnhardt's car. Dale looks pretty strong. Is he giving you any feedback on the radio about track conditions and the tires, the new tires? No, no, he hasn't been communicating. He hasn't said anything about the track or the tires yet. Any strategy about being out front this early? You're going to show what you have early, or are you just going to bide your time? No, we're just going to get out there and run and just see how everything goes to start with. You know, Jeff looks real strong, and it's too early to really tell. This track always changes on you, so we just have to see when it starts changing. Okay, Richard Childress, Dale Earnhardt's owner. All right, thank you, Jerry Geppins. This is Daryl Waltrip, who has had a dry spell in uh, winning on the Oval since 1985. He is currently running in the number 15 position. He's been running rather well, but he's been sitting in that 7, 8, 9 position, and the other people that are out in front are just too strong for him, and he can't catch them. People like Earnhardt. And Davey Allison, who has started at the back of the pack and is now making a very bold move up through. There's A.J. Foyt running in what Earnhardt said is a very strong car. But uh, Foyt on the upside and the car trying to slide down on the inside of him. And Benny Parsons uh, uh, will, uh, will take him. Yeah, that's the uh, sixth spot there is uh, Parsons goes beneath Foyt and takes six. Bill Foyt Parsons. Not so. yeah, yeah, that's... Uh, Car number 90. There's A.J. Foyt, the Super Techs, a four-time Indy 500 winner. Then a 500 start, 17. Best finish here, the winner in 71. Well, we told you something early about the, the foibles of Foyt over the weekend. Uh, he had a commitment here to run this race, but he also had a commitment for the 12-hour endurance race at Sebring. So he got out first yesterday and qualified number six, and he left the Atlanta International Raceway, went out and got on an airplane, and uh, carrying a change of clothes with him and his toothbrush, he took off for Sebring. And he went on down to Sebring, and he had a pretty good run. He finished fourth with his teammates, Hurley Haywood and uh, Rob Dyson, 14 laps behind the leader. There's the landing at Sebring. They completed 304 laps on the 4.11-mile uh, track, equaling uh, the 1,249-plus miles traveled, and the average race speed was like uh, almost 109 miles an hour. So driving the Porsche, A.J. had a busy night, got on the airplane uh, early hours of the morning and showed up here, jumped in his car, and right now he has lost a spot from his starting position, dropping from sixth back to seventh. So we go back into the leading group, and you've got Earnhardt now, who's uh, stretched his lead some over Jeff Bodine. You figure you're going to get somewhere around 50, somewhere between 56 and 63 laps before anybody has a, a fuel stop. And probably you're going to see a lot of most of the cars changing four tires instead of the normal two. Battle back in the pack, Keith. Uh, Benny Parsons back there in the car number 90 back there. That's Brett Bodine. He's back in the pack. Bodine driving the car that won this race a year ago with Ricky Rudd. That's the car number 15 in the right of your screen. A.J. Foote moving in on that car. And there's Benny Parsons in the middle of your screen. Parsons currently being shown in fourth spot. 
As far as the Allisons are concerned, we've documented Davies' bold move early in the race. Bobby Allison, who started 27th, has picked up 10 positions. Davies dead. And uh, Bobby is now running in the number 17 position. And Davies sitting there in car number 28. He's running in number 24 when we last clocked him. And Davy really moving up now. That's the veteran Buddy Baker in front of the young Allison. And that is Michael Waltrip. Darrell Waltrip's younger brother in front of the two of those cars. And Davy Allison moves to the inside. Makes it look quite easy on the back stretch. He slips in the deep underneath Buddy Baker. Bobby Allison now 17. Davy Allison has now jumped at five more notches. He's now 19. And they were talking yesterday about having qualified with an engine that they hadn't expected to. They call it a mule. And I want to tell you, that's the fastest mule uh, around Hampton, Georgia today, because that thing is hauling. And the man who's hauling right now is that man right there. And that new color scheme for Dale Earnhardt, the black and silver. They talked about Earnhardt being an aggressive driver and somewhat being overly aggressive last year. And it's somewhat appropriate that they have taken the L.A. Raider color scheme of black and silver. Uh, uh, the crew now being dressed in that as they are watching. And we are under yellow here, Keith. We've got a yellow, and I'm looking for where the trouble was, but the yellow flag is out, and the yellow flag was out as we had Rusty Wallace hooking up in a battle for third, so that slows them down. And as the yellow flag comes out, there's your leaders, Earnhardt in front. The yellow flag is still out in the Atlanta 500. Derek Cope apparently blew an engine or dumped some oil or something, but he rolled in the pit road that brought out the yellow and everybody has gone into the pits and everybody that I've been able to see has taken on four tires plus the fuel after 20 laps the average speed 165.067 miles an hour for the, the leader the Lipton International Players Tennis Championships lead off next Saturday sports here on ABC professional bowlers tour will follow at 3 Eastern and Pacific time that's the true value open for 150,000 bucks and then ABC's wide world of sports comes along. The Iditarod, sled dog race from Alaska, Anchorage to Nome, and Susan Butcher won it again. Men's World Cup skiing also on Saturday. That's ABC's wide world of sports at 4.30 Eastern and Pacific. Davey Allison has been a big story so far in the Atlanta 500. Here's Jack Aroot with more of the story. And Keith, Robert Yates is Davey Allison's crew chief. And Robert, it wasn't a good day during qualifying for you. You had an engine all picked out. It blew. You went out and qualified with a backup engine. But first, you had an engine that was disapproved by NASCAR. What's the story? Well, we just had something that was a little bit different. And uh, we put a lot of time and effort into it. Hope we could come back here and try to win this race with it. Uh, it wasn't, I didn't know it wasn't approved. We didn't ask any questions, but they told us. So you had to go back and use an engine that you'd already used here last year, and you call it the mule? Well, we, we're using the same block crank and solar heads we ran here one year ago, the last race here. Car ran good then. Uh, looks like it's running pretty good now, so maybe we don't need that little extra power that we thought we had, but, you know, we just got to go along with whatever happens. So. You know, Keith, they always said someday a mule might win the Kentucky Derby. Maybe a mule might win today. Also, let me update you also on another story. First tire change of the afternoon. Hoosiers go on the car 33 of Harry Gantz. So we're beginning to see the change. We'll keep an eye on Mr. Gantz and see what happens to him because those tires, I understand, take a little longer to heat up. The yellow flag is still out until they can clean up whatever it was that uh, Derek Cope dropped probably oil so they'll put the oil dry down I suppose and uh, bang around here for a while until they're they're certain they can uh, keep them on the track and Keith the young Cope 28 years old from Spanaway Washington out on the west coast will take his car to the garage area let's take a look at the leaders there well, you see Dave Marcus he's been around a long time this of course are the standings after they have made their pit stops Bill Elliott ducked in twice during the yellow flag and so he has rearmed himself for apparently two different reasons. Well, we are told that Elliot may have an ignition problem. They said the car was missing. He came back down pit road, and we are checking in it right now. We will see uh, with Ernie Elliott, who went in the car and changed. They have a backup ignition system in the car they can go to, and maybe they have the problem solved, but Elliot is far at the tail of the field. And we've got the green, and Earnhardt goes bolting back into the lead, and Bodine goes right along with it, both of them, Lord, right by Dave Marcus. 
So it's obvious, uh, isn't it, that Earnhardt has come to Atlanta with a very strong automobile. Look at the line Earnhardt takes through the corner, almost on the bottom of the racetrack. He had those left side tires on that inside white line, just where the apron of the track begins. His car is handling flawlessly. Watch him in turn one. Now the middle groove, he brings the car down off the track, almost against that white line in the middle of the groove. No one, no one will catch him there. Now let's follow up on the Bill Elliott story with Jerry Gappins. We're with Bill Elliott's team owner, Harry Malian. And Harry, you brought Bill in a couple times. What's the problem right now? Well, the, the car was missing, so they, uh, they we've been working on it. It looks like we have a broken distributor, and it's going to take a little longer to fix it. We need another caution. Once we get that, we'll be okay. How long would it take to replace a distributor? Under caution, we do one lap. One lap. So Bill Elliott having problems with this car right now favor because this is his home track here in Atlanta. Well, it's the little gremlins sometimes that drive you nuts. You, you think you've got a, a $100,000 race car primed and ready to run, and some of them cost more than that. And all of a sudden, it's the little nitpicking things that just drive you crazy. And Keith, at this racetrack at 170 plus mile per hour speeds, it won't take long for Elliott to get lapped. He is far back in the field. In fact, he's almost a half a lap down now as the leaders bear down on him. There's Earnhardt and Bodine. They are moving in. They're about a straightaway and a half away from Bill Elliott. And they'll lap him in about another 10 or 12 laps. Yes, Earnhardt is going uh, off turn two. Elliott is just coming off turn four, and he obviously does not have a healthy car. That's Brett Bodine in car number 15. But remember, they're still shuffling now. Some of your faster cars were caught back in the middle of the pack. As a result of the yellow flag and the pit stops, and it'll take them a half a dozen laps to get things sorted out and for the leadership to reassert itself. And of course, I'm not speaking. There's car number seven. That's Alan Kulwicki. He's got the race camera inside the car. You saw the smoke billowing out from under him. And uh, Alan's got a problem. Boy, and uh, does he ever. He probably has erupted an engine. A tough break for Kulwicki, but what a break for Bill Elliott. Elliott now with the yellow flag coming back out. We'll get to make that mandatory pit stop and come back and get that distributor changed. But a, what a break for Alan Kowicki. His best starting spot ever here in Atlanta. He started 12th today, hoping to improve on a tremendous fourth place finish a couple of weeks ago at Rockingham. So Kowicki, uh, who uh, again is race wise and uh, a lot of common sense, he got his car off the racetrack very quickly, too. He, If he is dumping oil, he got it down out of the way and he didn't spill a whole lot of it on the track. And Atlanta 500. Ricky Rudd talks about Quaker State with QSX. In over there, and you can just barely see the top of it, is car number 28, Davy Allison. There's been a fire in the car. Apparently, Davy is all right, as best we know at this particular point. As a result of Alan Kulwicki's engine blowing, oil spilling onto the track, Allison was right in behind him. Here's the Kowicki car now as uh, the engine let go with our live camera inside it. Davy Allison hit the oil, hit the wall, came back down inside, and it appeared that there was a substantial fire. Watch but Alan Kowicki there, Keith. He's trying to hang on to the car, and oil now is spewing from beneath the car, and, it, and the rear wheels are slipping and sliding. He's working that steering wheel like he's swatting flies inside that car. Back and forth, he saw the steering wheel to hang on to it, but Davy Allison was coming up behind him as some of the cars were going around. Allison was running so quickly trying to catch the leaders. This car hit that oil, and across the bank it went, and boom, into the outside retaining wall. Let's see. You see, Allison, wasn't that Davy tucked right behind him? Oh, that was Labonte, I guess. Yeah, that's Davy Allison, a couple of cars back. That's Davy, the black car there. Right here. Yep. So the oil hits the uh, surface. Davy has no chance to avoid it. And once you hit it going at that speed, and particularly in the turns, and uh, re emphasize what we showed you a little while ago. Half of this racetrack is turns. I mean, you spend a long time in a turning posture here at the Atlanta International Raceway. Bill Elliott, meantime, lucks out because he gets the yellow that he so desperately needed in order to repair the electrical problem. Jerry Gappins, do you have more on that? 
As you see, the crew is working right now. They're making one of the fastest distributor changes in history. You won't find it at your local car garage by any means. So far, they've been working on about three minutes. It looks like he's lost two laps now, and Bill Elliott sits patiently in the car. Here's what they've done. They've changed the spark plug wires, everything connected electrical, and hopefully get this thing firing right so he can go back out and run. The one thing that has helped him a little bit, this has come very early in the race, and if anybody can make up laps here at Atlanta, it's Bill Elliott. Back upstairs, you, Keith. Yeah, but you got that the bad dude, Dale Earnhardt, sitting out in front, and Bodine is just a whisper back of him, uh, and uh, those are two pretty good guys to try to run down. I don't care if you are Bill Elliott, and coming from two laps back, it would be heroic. There's where we are at the present time, our second yellow. Laps completed, 33, and the leader is Earnhardt, followed by Bodine, Wallace, Parsons, and Brett Bodine in the Atlanta 500 of Davy Allison being towed to the garage. As soon as it passes around that truck, you'll be able to see what happened to it. He fungoed the wall pretty well. There was a fire. Davy has been hauled into the first aid area by ambulance, got out on his own, walked in to be checked. So apparently he is all right, but the car is a mess. Alan Kulwicki was the man who had the engine let go and dumped the oil to start of the chain reaction, and Jack Arood is with him. Alan, not much you can do when an engine lets go like that. No, it really blew without warning, and uh, I had my hands full there for a while. I thought maybe we were going to lose it and crash, but at least I managed to keep the car under control and didn't crash it. it it's too bad that we're out this early. The Xerox Amico Ford Thunderbird was running real good. When you say you keep a car under control, what really can you do when there's oil under the wheels and you're spinning wildly in a corner? Well, when the car starts to get sideways, you've got to correct it. And, and I did that once, and it seemed to be under control, and all of a sudden it did it again, and I thought we were going to lose it. but. Uh, I don't know what the in-car camera showed there, but it's too bad we had a short day, but at least everyone saw what it's like to blow an engine at 170 miles an hour. I think there's a couple of million people that don't want to see it again, though, Keith. <laughs> Scary. Woo -hoo. I tell you, he's an impressive young driver. At 33 years of age, he's got a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, and uh, he was the 86th rookie of the year on the NASCAR Tour. He didn't come into the NASCAR the, the normal way, I guess some of the Southern Stock Car guys say. He didn't come from the short track to the south. He came from the Midwest, Keith, and uh, done a heck of a job the last couple of years. Of course, they do some fair to middle and head button up in that part of the country, too, on some of those short tracks and dirt tracks. As they come around this time, we anticipate the pace car leaving and the green flag coming out. Bill Elliott is just now leaving the pits and he is five laps down. Elliott has lost five laps, but hopefully for him, they have corrected the electrical problems. But remember, the guy's up in front, and there you see him. That's Earnhardt three, Bodine five, Wallace 27, uh, Benny Parsons 90. He's right up there, Brett Bodine in 15. These are tough people to catch. And Elliott, as he left pit road, five laps down. So Awesome Bill from uh, Dawson Bill may be in trouble. Earnhardt pops right out of the pack, goes to the lead as the green comes down. They scatter them out there, three and four rest in turn one. There's not a lot of room down there, but again, Earnhardt is on the bottom of the racetrack, but the bid is for second spot there, Keith. Rusty Wallace. And Bodine now is going to come up in the yellow and white car and pass. That's Jeff Bodine, pass Rusty, and they run in that order. Then Earnhardt, Bodine, and Wallace. Turn number four is where most of the trouble historically has happened on this racetrack. And as you come down off four, uh, your car gets very light. Now, yesterday, the wind was very, very gusty here. Today, it is a relatively calm day. And certainly uh, most pleasant, considering what the weather has been in the Atlanta area. Give an idea of the speed these cars are running when they come by. The drivers talk about this track being so deceptively quick. Uh, you're running 170 miles an hour on the average in race traffic, and you may be able to see an accident in front of you, but you can't get the car stopped. That's what happened to Kale Yarborough here back at last year. He T-boned the car over in turn three, saw what was happening, but couldn't get the car wound down. They string out just a bit with Earnhardt, Jeff Bodine, Rusty Wallace, Benny Parsons is running fourth, and Brett Bodine is uh, running in the number five spot. Cale Yarborough hits pit road. Morgan Shepard started 20th, and Morgan has now moved up to eighth in the field. So he has made a bold move as well. And Bobby Allison is also beginning to make his presence felt. There's the look at the front five. Here's a look at your second group for five. This will take you through 10 places, and that's the way they're running at this time. You see Bobby Allison now has moved up to number nine with Darrell Waldron 10th, 
And uh, these are the people out of the race. Kulwicki, Davey Allison, H.B. Bailey, and uh, Mead. Jamie Mead. As we mentioned, Kelly Arbor had an unscheduled stop just a minute ago. Yarbor came in from right side tires, and he will go a lap down on the leaders. There's the battle for fourth and fifth spot. Brett Bodine, the left side of your screen, the car number 15. And, of course, the Oldsmobile for Sterling Marlin. Sterling Marlin, of course, the, uh, the son of a gentleman that I remember from many, many years of racing, Cuckoo Marlin, out of Tennessee. He's Cuckoo and Eula Fay's oldest boy, and they're pride and joy up there in uh, Tennessee. Of course, Cuckoo uh, has retired from Winston Cup racing, but he ran, uh, he won a qualifying race at Daytona back a few years ago, and he smiled for weeks after that. <laughs> and he did. to the Elliott pit stop. There's Ernie Irvin in the pits, Keith, uh, one of the West Coast drivers who's moved east to try to get involved in this sport. Uh, young up-and-coming rookie driver, but Elliott was in the pits for a total of 8 minutes and 31 seconds, and when you calculate it out, it's five laps he lost under caution. Ernie Irvin is out of Modesto, California, and they've jacked up the car on the inside. Jerry Gappins now. Let's finish off the story on the travails of Bill Elliott. Well, here's his older brother, Ernie Elliott. He lost five laps, but you did it in eight minutes, but it's still going to be difficult to come back. How do you approach the race now knowing you're five laps down? Run as hard as you can go. <laughs> What's Bill saying? Did you fix it now? Not that now, you know, we're just trying to concentrate on getting, getting back to the front. We're a little bit disadvantaged because we didn't change tires. The guys up tires in front got fresh tires on. So that's going to hurt us, but it's still a long day. In your mind right now, do you think you have any chance at all now to win? Well, I'll tell you this much, we ain't giving up. Okay, there's the determination in this Elliott pit. They're right here before their hometown fans, and they want it, They got something to prove now. Ain't redheaded for nothing, are they? I tell you what, they really want to get a win here. The battle there goes on here as Benny Parsons uh, moves up alongside Rusty Wallace, bidding for third place, and Benny's uh, moving along very well now, isn't he? He is now running third, while A.J. Foyt is backing up. A.J. is now back to 15th position after starting sixth. Benny Parsons, the best run he's had in that car, the Dunlavy car, that's the car that was vacated by Kenny Schrader when he moved over to the Rick Hendrick team this year. And, of course, Parsons, uh, best finish this year, 14th coming on the short tracks at Richmond. He is not done well on the speedways. He finished 31st at Daytona and 33rd at Rockingham two weeks ago. All right, what about the guy that has won two of three races this year, plus a 500-kilometer race down in Australia, Neil Bonnet, driving car number 75, which is hauling a live ABC camera. He is still back in the pack, but still very, very much a factor in this uh, shootout in Atlanta. There's a picture of what's going on inside Neil Bonnet's car. I like the man, he's very direct. You ask him a question, you get a straightforward answer from him. And he, I think, is proving, to, if he hadn't already proved it, he has certainly proven that he could come back from serious injury. He suffered that broken leg, a severely broken leg, from an ordinary kind of an accident, but he's fought his way back and is having a very good early season in 1988. You know, Keith, I talked to him shortly after his accident. He was in the hospital. The doctors were very, not very optimistic. They said, you know, you not only may not race again, you may not walk again. He shattered that right femur. That's the upper bone and the right leg. Uh, like someone would take a piece of hard candy and hit it with a hammer. Just bone fragments everywhere. And they were going to try to reconstruct that leg and told him he may not walk for five or six months. Now, we're here we are five and a half months later, and he has already won two races going for win number three. Well, he started number 30. He is now running 23rd in the uh, race, and uh, the attrition has helped him some because he so far has not been able to make a very bold move. You've got to have determination to do what he's doing. You've got to respect the law of averages. You've got to understand in this sport that you're going to get hurt along the way. Neil Bonnet, as we noted, has just come back from a very tough adventure. Jack Aruth has the full story here. It was lap 56, and Neil Bonnet's encounter with the wall looked relatively common, but the results were quite the opposite. I've been hurt a lot of times in a race car, but that, that was it. Uh, when it broke my leg, it, the doctor said it moved it over about three inches and then really just drove it back up in my groin. So the problem I had, the leg wasn't just broken and splintered so bad, but it just drove it so far back up in me and they couldn't get it turned to get me out of the car without cutting the roof off, so it was a mess. Surgeons put Bonnet's leg back together with a parts list that sounded like it was more for his car. A 14-inch steel rod, seven screws, and metal bolts. Then Bonnet started his rehabilitation. 
I'd go down to the basement by myself in the den, had the equipment, and I mean, I sat there literally had tears running out of my eyes, and I knew the procedure I had to go through, what was required to get it well, and I'd do it a little bit and I'd quit. And then I'd have to make myself, you know, continue on with it. And I, I'm saying that there's people out there that's been through the same thing, and it's no sad story that hadn't been heard by a lot of people and people going through it today. But I just had such a limited time that we, I, they were telling me it was impossible. And uh, I just had to, we had to buck the odds, you know, just, I had to just keep going and going and going. And I didn't think I could make it to Daytona. They had me thinking I couldn't, and I turned it to where I thought I could, and then we made it. It was. It was close. I, I was down there borderline when I was at Daytona. I, could, I had to tell some white lies, tell everybody I was well, but I wasn't well when I was in Daytona. I had a broken leg and still broken, and it was a matter of letting it come around. It's getting better. I, I got six more months for it to be completely well, but I'm good right now. During that rehabilitation period, Neil decided to rededicate himself to racing, and his efforts paid off when he captured the second race of the year at Richmond, starting a win streak that now sits at three. I've won a lot of races on sportsman racing. I've enjoyed some victories in the Winston Cup racing and stuff, but that really meant a lot. Uh, man, it felt so good. And But I, I've said it before, and I'll have to say it again. The biggest victory of the year was walking through the tunnel of Daytona. I had, uh, I won Richmond, but that was the second win of the year. My first one was Daytona, just getting that. I didn't win Daytona 500 and get the first place check, but I, I won it two weeks before the race started, just going down there, getting my driver's license, going in there, sitting in that race car and competing. Uh, the rest of this stuff has just been icing on the cake. Well, the Pontiac folks are certainly happy to have him come back because uh, he's posted back-to-back -back wins for them. First time it's been done since 63, and the guys who did it back then were Hall of Famers Joe Weatherly and Buck Baker. Keith, you know, Neil Bonnet's family, his, uh, his wife uh, and daughter, they would leave the house. They told me I was over there. They said they just couldn't stand to hear him scream as he tortured himself three times a day for an hour and a half each workout trying to recondition that leg so he could not only walk but drive a race car. So don't tell us he ain't got gizzards, right? He's a tough one. Lake Speed has been having trouble. He's been out in and out of the pits, and uh, he's just not having a good day. Cale Yarborough has put his car in the garage and parked it. So he's out of the race as well, car number 29. There it is. He backed up pit road, and I, I think it was sort of a gamble that nobody else was coming down because Kale came down to his pits and then back way back up there to get into the garage area. Kale, the winningest driver at this track, has won seven times. Six of those wins coming in the spring race here, the Atlanta 500, but again, Kale's bad luck continues. He has not won a race in Winston Cup competition since October 1985. Look at Benny Parsons now, who's closed in on on uh, uh, Jeff Bodine, and he's trying to get the gate open and get by him as Dale Earnhardt continues to run out in front, and his lead is now more than half a second, .65, according to our watch, the lead for Earnhardt over the number two car, the yellow one there, uh, Jeff Bodine, but Benny Parsons is, uh, is close enough, and Benny gets him uh, sized up just right and feels the draft just right. That's when he'll take his shot at him. But Bodine right now has sort of got Benny on the hip, and he won't give him much room. Benny Parsons, a 46-year-old veteran from Ellerby, North Carolina. And Keith, his last two victories came here at this racetrack. He won an invitational race back in 1986, and he won this race, the Atlanta 500, back in 1984. So he locks this track, and apparently he's doing a heck of a job right now trying to work over Jeff Bodine for second spot. Well, he, he wants that low uh, slot through the turn, the long turn here in Atlanta, and Bodine won't give it to him. He's just keeping it in. Jeff's holding his own. You notice that the rear end of these cars seem a little loose. Well, they, they may seem like it. They are. They like to run them that way because you can run them faster that way. That goes back to what Dale said about AJ's car yesterday, that it, he thought it was a very strong automobile, but he thought it was tighter than uh, one would want it to be successful on this particular track. And now Benny Parsons may have a shot at him, Keith, but Bodine is strong on that quarter mile straightaway. Again, that's not the critical part of this racetrack. In most tracks, the straightaway is where you do all the passing, but in Atlanta, there's very little straightaway. As we showed you that graphic early on in the show, we have two half miles and quarters. Now. And now OBP, Benny Parsons will take second spot. Richard Petty, incidentally, is now running in uh, 12th spot after starting 24. So the attrition and uh, a good heady 167 plus mile an hour speed is helping Richard Petty. Now the story on Cale Yarborough. Jack, Jerry got Cale Yarborough too early to be in the garage, Jerry. What happened? Well, we got a broken axle, or I believe it's a broken axle. We're going to try to fix it and get back out. We Something just popped. 
say you're going to go back out, obviously you're going to lose a few laps. So what's the idea going back out? You don't have anything to prove at this time in your career. We're here to compete. And that's what we're going to try to do. Well, as we're finding out from Bill Elliott's crew and T.L. Yarbrough, people like to compete down here in the south. And as you can see right now, they've taken an axle out of the car, and they're going to put a brand-new axle back in, and they'll drop it down off the jack and get Kale back out in competition, Keith Jackson. Okay, Jerry Geppins, and he'll be in there a while while they do this. Of course, he can bring out his other businesses and concentrate on them. He's in the fast food business. He's, he's got a car dealership. He's got a farm. He's got all kinds of things going. Right now, Dale Earnhardt is leading Betty Parsons by 1.2 seconds in the Atlanta 500. So Betty Parsons running a heady race, very strong, has taken over second place from Jeff Bodine, who set a track record in qualifying yesterday. We've cruised through 60 laps, and we've got 328 total in the race. So we got 260 to go. When Earnhardt is running that strong, I mean, you just sort of roll your eyes up and uh, lean back and relax because uh, it, he is a good, tough front runner. You got to believe that Dale Earnhardt got a good set of tires. I mean, by good, I mean a properly matched set of tires. You hear us talk about the term stagger, and that's where the handling comes in. A properly sized set of tires, particularly across the rear of that car, has enabled him to run on the bottom groove inside. He's moving inside of Eddie Pierce while there. All right, let's check the running order for you. Earnhardt leads it, Benny Parsons second, Bodine, Jeff is third, Rusty Wallace, Sterling Marlin. We'll be back with more exclusive coverage of the Atlanta 500 after this commercial and a word from our local stations. With an optional four-liter monster under its hood, Jeep Comanche doesn't just stand apart. It stands alone. Save up to $1,800. Sports exclusive being brought to you by Thompson, the first name in lasting protection. By Kellogg's Corn Flakes, what more could you want from a cereal? And by Budweiser, proud sponsor of the 1988 U.S. Olympic team. This Bud's for you. The leadership... Well, Benny Parsons has closed the gap with Dale Earnhardt, and he's sitting right in there pecking away at him right now. So Benny bidding for a share of the lead in the running of this Atlanta 500. Bobby Allison is now well up in the field. Bobby is running in the number six position. His son, Davey Allison, is out of the race. Wreck, he's been checked. Let's find out the circumstance right now with Davey Allison. This Jack of good talk with him. Davey, very simply, what happened? Well, I got in Allen's oil and his engine let go down there in the first turn, and there's just nothing you can do when you get in that oil. You just hang on and hope for the best. And I just about had the car straightened back out, and it turned uphill into the wall, and I hit it nose first. And, you know, that's one heck of an impact. That's the hardest I've ever hit head on. But we got to keep our spirits up and go to Darlington next week and try to get them again. Now, you've also injured your knee. You wrapped it pretty good in that hit, huh? Yeah, I think I hit a roll bar under the dash with my left knee, but it's okay. Uh, it's going to be a little sore for a couple of days, but it ain't going to slow us down any. And it won't stop him from his Monday pastime either, gentlemen. He'll be out fishing tomorrow, I'll guarantee you that. <laughs> Are they back? Okay. Right now, car number 12, Bobby Allison, running there in the number six position. And in the meantime, up front, we've got a scuffle going on as Benny Parsons is bidding to take the lead from Dale Earnhardt. Now, they're catching up with some of the slower traffic. They've already lapped some of the trailing cars, and Benny's down low, forcing Dale high, but you see there's a car in front of him. That's and Rodney Coles there, Keith. The Rodney Coles one of the lap cars. Now, Benny just splits the, the two cars, and he will take the lead in turn three. You know, Benny Parsons, a uh, crew chief on that car. Interesting, he's passing Dale Earnhardt there as he goes around a little lap car, but uh, the car of Ken Reagan is young Doug Reichert, a youngster about 30 years of age, and Reichert was the crew chief for Dale Earnhardt when Earnhardt won here in 1980 and went on to win the NASCAR championship that year. So now it looks like Earnhardt's not going to give it up too easily. One of the things you don't want to, you see that white uh, line that Earnhardt is flirting with up there, you don't want to get too far over that thing because as the day goes on, you start to get marbles. 
at little bits and pieces of track and rubber that accumulate up there. And if you get up above that white line, you're just simply not going to be able to hang on. Your car is going to break loose. You see it. Look at that. See, he got a little high, and that the rear end really got fishy on him. So it's Dale Earnhardt in the black car, number three, Betty Parsons in car number 90. And they have a door handle duel going right now for the lead of the Atlanta 500. Lap 71 out of the 328. There's your running order. Jeff Bodine, the man who uh, set the new qualifying record. And again, Parsons down low, but Benny's starting to smoke a little bit. I can't tell if that's tire smoke or if it's coming from some other place. Probably tire smoke. Yeah, it looks to be tire smoke. You really had the car coming off the corner, but we are showing yellow flag again, Keith, as uh, Harold Kinder now unfurls the yellow and points over tur toward turns one and two, so possibly some debris on track. Now, one car has spun. Bill there Parsons. Is Bill Parsons, that car down on the apron. He spun and contacted a little bit of the outside retaining wall. Bill having five uh, starts at Atlanta, his best finish, 18th, of course, a couple of years ago, but uh, had his best finish ever of his career. Earlier this year at Daytona, he finished third behind the father-son duo of Bobby and Davey Allison. So the younger brother of Benny Parsons, Phil, runs into some bad luck and uh, kisses the wall. And uh, this brings out the yellow, our third yellow of the race. We are at 72 laps worked and this obviously means everybody dives back into the pits and here's where the guys earn their supper money right here. Well indeed this is where the work is really and critical because now they've run about 45 laps or so and there is Earnhardt the leader of the crew going to work on the right side and the bottom of your screen that is the of course car of Benny Parsons it looks like Earnhardt's crew a three time world champion pit crew they have races for the pit crews yes every year on the NASCAR tour at the end of the season they will have a pit crew competition. And those guys on the top of the screen have won it three consecutive years in a row, changing four tires and adding fuel to the car. Looks like a good stop for Benny Parsons' crew. The left side jack still up on the car, but look at Earnhardt. He's already moving down pit road. Great stop again for that World Championship crew. That's 23.07 for Earnhardt. That's four tires, gas, something to drink, pat on the back, see you later. Not bad. Lake Speed is out of the race. Here's Jerry Gaffins with it. Well, Lake has flexed his muscle early in this NASCAR season, but he's out already. What happened, Lake? I think we fell to a cracked cylinder head, probably. The winds came hard. Delco battery Ozonville was coming coming right on up through the pack, just as we had planned. Our strategy with the Hoosier tires, of course, was to not maybe qualify so good, but we thought the race would come to us. And as it was going, it really was. We were starting to pick our way on up through the field and it made ourselves made our ways right up to the right before getting in the top ten early on. It was a little earlier than we even thought we'd be there. You mentioned the Hoosiers real quickly. Any problems with them at all? Had you changed tires before you dropped out? Oh, we changed tires a couple times just like everybody did just because there's a new tire and a track. We weren't for sure what would happen, so we wanted to pull them off and look at them, but they looked great, so we knew we were in real good shape. We were just waiting to ride her on out and see if we couldn't get right back up there and put a, put one of these things away for us. Uh, it's been a close season. The wind's car has been right there every time, but uh, you know, you can't win them all. You can't run great in all of them, but the team is really doing a super job and uh, we're looking forward to the next race. Okay, Lake Speed still smiles even though he's out of the race here at Atlanta. And he's had his trouble here at this uh, raceway. In 1985, he was leading in the points till he fell out early in the Atlanta 500, so uh, he figures this track owes him something somewhere along the way. Meantime, it's a nice day, a lot of hot dogs and other things being sold here in Hampton, Georgia, just outside the city limits of Atlanta. And the running of the Atlanta 500, 74 laps now in the books. Dale Earnhardt and Betty Parsons still fighting for the lead. Front runners, and you see some shuffling because of the pit stops under yellow. And we'll get to green here, uh, probably this next time around. Now the people who are out of the race means Bailey Kulwicki, Davey Allison, Lake Speed, and uh, Phil Parsons. We'll check Phil as soon as he's released from the first aid room. Harry Gant has been lapped. Last year he crashed on the back stretch, injured himself in this race, nearly bit his tongue off, as a matter of fact. But Harry hasn't had a whole lot of luck in recent times either. Cale Yarborough is now, we believe, 16 laps down because he came back in and he, he just uh, lost another one to the leaders. But when uh, we start unwrapping here and get this green flag, you see Rusty Wallace there trying to heat up his tires in car number 27 because everybody came bolting back in. Bill Elliott came back in as well, and he did not 
pick up a lap. If he'd have stayed out on the track, he possibly could have unwound himself at least by one notch. But uh, he was five laps down and remained so to the leaders uh, up in front. Dale Earnhardt right there in that black car number three is going to go right up into turn number one and continue to lead the race. Now, Benny Parsons is going to have to work his way back through some traffic because uh, Rusty Wallace is now second. Jeff Bodine is now third. And uh, Benny will let things string out a bit here and uh, see if he can get himself rolling again. Jack Root, you have a report regarding Benny Parsons. Well, Keith, they came in, and Doug Riker is the crew chief on Benny Parsons' car, and you didn't really change a thing, although you changed tires. Yes, sir. We got four tires. We just put four brand-new tires. We kept our original stagger that we intend to all day if the chassis stays the same. And a bullseye car is running very well. We just hope to be there in the end. Benny said on the radio that everything is really good, huh? Hey, he came back. He says he was just having a good old time right there. And any time you can get up with the Earnhardt bunch, you're running very well. Now, this is something new for you. You've started changing tires again. You haven't done that for a couple of years. Yeah, you caught me there a little earlier. I was just a little bit out of breath. But the crew is doing real good. And, and I think we're going to have our stuff together where we, he can come in and we'll get him back out in the lead. Keith, this team is a melding of the old and the new, the young and the old. Parsons, I wouldn't really call him old, but this guy I'd call very young. Back to you. All right, he's currently running in the number four position. Earnhardt leads it. Uh, Bodine and Wallace have sort of hooked up now in second place with uh, Rusty running second and Bodine right behind him in third. And the speed on that restart lap, better than 170 miles an hour. Goes to show you how critical fresh tires are here in Atlanta. Fresh rubber for about a five or six lap run. We will pick up your speed some three or four miles per hour. Look at the look at the lap that uh, Rusty Wallace is turning there. His car not getting that well through turns one and two, as Jeff Bodine now on the rear deck. But going into three, Wallace brings the car all the way down to the bottom of the racetrack. Those two guys trying to run down the leader, Dale Earnhardt. Earnhardt now has uh, stretched his lead just a bit. Running in the number five position is Terry Labonte in Junior Johnson's car. Bobby Allison rolls along in number six. Sterling Marlin is seven. Back in 11 position is Mark Martin, a young man who's trying to make a comeback. From uh, He was in Winston Cup racing at a time, dropped out for a while, and has fought his way back to run for the big boy. Interesting story about Rusty Wallace. He ran his first race here in Atlanta back in 1980. In fact, he was driving a car for Roger Penske. He was 23 years old. It was his first ever NASCAR race and his first ever 500 miler. In fact, he qualified seventh and ran with the leaders all day. Ended up finishing second to the man he's chasing right now, Dale Earnhardt. Well, the clock here is on car number 27, Rusty Wallace. Rusty from St. Louis, Missouri. And he's driving a car that's owned by Raymond Beadle. A lot of you might remember Raymond Beadle from his drag racing days. He was tough in drag racing, and he's moved into stock car racing now and is doing very well with it. They should run this lap somewhere between 32 and 33. Maybe a little over 33 if they're still... Oh, look at that. That's pretty quick. 173.392 miles per hour. That is indeed a quick lap, and that's again those fresh tires as those cars now are running in. That's Benny Parsons now coming in the picture. Parsons being shown back in fourth spot, but he is moving in on the leaders. That's Earnhardt, the leader, Wallace running second, then Jeff Bodine, Parsons, and Terry Levani is fifth. Davey Allison, uh, one of the majors out of the race, hit the wall. He's gone for the day. The average speed of the race, what with three yellow flags, right at 126 miles per hour. The weather is perfect. Over a half million dollars in posted monies for the Atlanta 500. And you're watching on ABC Sports. Dale Earnhardt is the man out in front. He's made a ton of money over the last couple of years. But uh, seems the same stable old country boy he's always been with a good touch of common sense about it. And it's always warming, always warming when you hear a guy who's got it going good, willing to help somebody else, and Earnhardt's one of those kind. The little guys don't keep coming. This sport won't keep growing. And, uh, you know, I help out a couple guys here and there, give them a set of tires or buy them a set or, uh, you know, just different ones. Ernie Irvin, we helped him some last year with sponsoring him at Charlotte, and he ran a real good race and, and showed some. Um, promise there, and I think it helped him get the ride he's got this year. 
he's got a lot of pressure on him this year, so he's, he's not going as good, but still. Uh, I like to see a guy that's got talent make it. Uh, Bush Grand National Race and I race against them some, and, and there's a lot of guys there that can make it and go on uh, if they use their head. And uh, You know, I don't mind helping somebody that works hard and tries to help yourself. Car number 14, spewing smoke, brings out the yellow. Looks like A.J. Foyt has dumped an engine. He won here in 1971. The last time he was able to win one of the NASCAR races was 1972 out at Ontario. Now he is bringing a, a wounded goose back to the barn because that one I think is done for the day. That one is cooked. AJ waving to the guards there, telling him he's going to make a left hand turn and take that smoking Oldsmobile back to the garage area. Phil Parsons uh, had a banger a few minutes ago, got checked by the doctors. He's now with Jerry Gappins. Phil, you're out of the hospital. First of all, how your condition? You all right? No, I'm just fine, Jerry. Thank you. What put you in the wall? Well, I guess we cut a tire down on our Crown Skull Classic Oldsmobile, and uh, the thing just turned right. Nothing I could do about it. Bet you are okay, though. Yeah, just a tribute to my, my guys, Leo and Andy, and all the guys. It was, you know, just to build a good car, and uh, it was a hard lick, but uh, not, not hurt at all. You cheer for your big brother, Benny, now? He's running awfully well out well, there. Well, I'm, I'm going to get over here, and yeah, I, I'm going to do that because we're out of contention to win the race, but I'm going to go over here, and uh, if there's any way possible, my guys will get the car back in the race. Okay, Phil Parsons out of the race. He turns into a cheerleader for his older brother, Benny, now. Meantime, under the yellow, everybody comes diving back into pit road. Uh, Dale Earnhardt, the leader, is in there, and uh, he's taken four new tires. So he hasn't run those very long. So somewhere down the road, if he needs a pair of scruffed up tires, uh, he'll have a pair to go back to. So we're back under yellow at the Atlanta 500. Next weekend. Shearson Lehman Hutton presents the Lipton International Players Tennis Championships here on ABC. Top tennis pros, including Steffi Graf, Jimmy Connors, Chris Everett, Matt Svilander, and others. For the individual titles, coverage begins live except on the West Coast. Saturday, 1 Eastern and Pacific, 12 Central, all on ABC Sports, followed by the True Value Open. That's the Pro Bowlers, 250000 bucks out of Peoria, Illinois. And the Iditarod Trail Sled Dog Race. Anchorage to Nome. That is our feature on ABC's Wide World of Sports along with World Cup skiing. A.J. Foyt out of the race. We look from inside Neil Bonnet's car. Now as Foyt's engine lets go, you know oil is going all over the place. You hope the good Lord is awake and going to help you out here because there isn't anything you can do about it in this circumstance. But again, you see the Kenny Foyt getting his car off the racetrack and preserving as much of a clean track as he possibly can. And so that's what brought out the yellow. And Keith, following those pit stops after the caution flag for the blown engine of A.J. Foyt, Benny Parsons is at the lead of the field, and Parsons has not led a race since October of 1987. So he's a pretty un unaccustomed to being up front, but I'm sure he likes what he sees right now. Clean racetrack as the safety car begins to pull away. Well, the reason uh, Benny is up there is because the other people dove into the pits during the yellow flag. Parsons did not come in, and so he wants to lead for a time. It's a heady adventure, and Earnhardt, who did come in, took on fuel and four more tires. He is going to be pretty well back in the stack here as we get the green, and Parsons looking for the lead in the first turn. Oh, that's close. That is really close. Eddie Bierschwell, car number 23, was down low, and uh, Benny Parsons just squeezed through to take the lead. And as uh, Dr. Jerry Point said, it's been a long time since uh, Benny has been out in front of this kind of a classy field. Number 23, uh, Pierce Whale, is not on the lead left either. But nonetheless, it's a car to be reckoned with. Jack Aroot now with A.J. Foyt. And Keith, you showed the replay from inside of Neil Bonnet's car. According to A.J. Foyt, that's the blindest you've ever been inside of a race car. Well, it probably is, Jackie. That's probably the most smoke I've ever seen in a race car in my life. And uh, like I said, I'm just glad Buddy was behind me because when he seen it, he tapped me a little bit, but I was able to get it back under control. But as far as me seeing anything down the back, sir, I had no idea where I was at. I was just hoping to keep between the fence. For a fellow that's tagged 50 years of age, you've been doing an awful lot of racing the last couple of years. What's the story? Well, the biggest thing is uh, I want to show people that I'm still A.J. Ford. I was at 20, uh, and I backed off a lot, but uh, I want to go after and start winning again. I'm hungry for victory. Well, I guess you can't have to do anything with A.J. Ford as long as you say win and a checkered flag, he'll be here. Back to you, Keith. 
All right, fun to see him having so much fun. Busy night last night. Tough luck today. Right now, after the restart following the fourth yellow, number three, Dale Earnhardt, is running in 17th position. He just went by Darrell Walter right there. They really get shuffled around as the field uh, uh, diminishes here because of attrition. And you, every time you get a yellow, boy, everybody's diving in for fresh rubber because this is a racetrack that eats it up. You've got long continuing turns here and that does eat up your tires the leader speed right now 167 plus miles an hour Dale Earnhardt trying to work that traffic back in the field he is mired now back in that second pack as Benny Parsons has pulled away but Earnhardt now working over the rear deck of the car of Terry Labonte Terry Labonte driving for the veteran car owner and Earnhardt just about gets the car out of shape as he turns the steering wheel hard left and shuffles by Labonte and now he'll work again. That's Eddie Beerswell, the car on the outside. Earnhardt's car now wobbling a little bit in the corner, but he gets it matter gathered back in. And he is headed to the front. That's Morgan Shepard in the car number 47. So Earnhardt's picking him off one by one. Yeah, but you know you get the feeling watching Earnhardt drive that he likes to have the rear end of that thing floating around like a feather. He likes that car loose. You know, he likes to lay back in the car. He almost lays down in the seat. He likes sort of like a recliner. They, they joke about having a recliner in the car. He says, if I get the car a little bit sideways and it bobbles back and forth, it keeps me awake. <laughs> Scare me to death. That's Bill Elliott right in front of Earnhardt there. Elliott, of course, having lost those five laps early with the ignition trouble, and he still is not up to speed as you see Earnhardt moving beneath the Morgan Shepard car. He keeps finding cracks, doesn't he? He is now in the number six position. He passed 13 automobiles in three laps. Yeah, he's not very patient when it comes to, to uh, running back in traffic. And uh, but you got to wonder, when he runs the car that hard, does he use up his tires? His tires are a critical factor here in Atlanta. And will he have anything left when he catches the leaders? That's Ricky Rudd, the defending champion of this Atlanta 500, in front of Earnhardt in the Kenny Bernstein owned car. Of course, Bernstein, a drag racer like Raymond Beetle, owns a stock car. And there's Earnhardt taking fifth spot. They just picked off Ricky Rudd right there. So. Earnhardt is on a charge back to the front, obviously running with all of the power and stability that uh, you could hope to have in an automobile. Started outside on the front row. Benny Parsons is the leader. But by now, I would imagine that Benny has been able to pick up that black car in his rear mirror and knows that Earnhardt is coming. I'm sure Doug Reichert, Benny Parsons' crew chief, is telling him that Earnhardt is just blowing by him one by one. And watch Earnhardt now on the inside of Kenny Schrader. Looks like Schrader just may have thrown an anchor out as Earnhardt goes by him and Schrader ducks back in and still losing ground. And when you're running and when you are as dominant as Earnhardt can be in, in circumstances like this, you'd think that somebody would like to latch on to him and hang on to him and draft with him, but heck, they can't run with him. Since meantime, Benny is out there running uh, pretty much uh, by himself. But now Earnhardt, as he comes down off turn number two, is going to have Parsons in his sights. Let's check the distance between the leader, Benny Parsons, and of course the cars back in the field. Parsons coming out of turn four in the Ford. It's like Parsons flashing by the start finish line. There's Benny Parsons, a Ford, the brown, white, orange. They glow orange colors for Benny Parsons. Back in a Ford for the first time. He drove Chevrolets the past few years. Of course, Parsons won ARCA Championship. That's the Midwestern stock car-based organization out of the Racing Club of America twice in his early career driving a Ford. So he's back in a Ford and doing awfully well today. There's a difference of 4.23 seconds between first and fourth. Kyle Petty in car number 21 is in second place. Rick Wilson is running third, and then you have Earnhardt. Earnhardt just picked off Wilson. And Earnhardt is now third. I tell you, the crews on pit road and the other competitors have got to be shaking their heads about now, Keith, as they watch what Dale Earnhardt is doing early on. Now, we were just at 100 laps here, about a little less than a third of the way through this Atlanta 500, and Earnhardt is already showing the dominance that car may have throughout the afternoon. But there is a thing called racing luck, and we got a car on the wall, Brad Teague, number 31. He has been involved in a scuffle previously. Teague now has kissed the wall, as you see, and he brings his car down off the racing surface. And 
that did not bring out a yellow. Uh, he tagged the wall over in turn two. That's one where one of our exits were on that graphic early in the track. That's a trouble spot, and that's where Teague tapped it, and he'll make his way back to the garage area. So apparently the marshal over there is satisfied that uh, Monsieur Debris has not made his first appearance of the day, and so they let him keep on racing because where he tapped the wall is a bit out of range. I mean, you really have to be out of control to get up there where it occurred. And nobody, if you don't see anything, they eyeball it. And if you don't see something on the track, they oftentimes let them go ahead and run, and that's exactly what they're doing right now. The leader is Benny Parsons, but Dale Earnhardt is in a full charge right now chasing number two, Kyle Petty, and we are at 102 laps in the Atlanta 500. Benny Parsons right now has come all the way from 17th to run second. Dale Earnhardt, there he is, the big black cloud on the horizon for many a person. What about this tire story we started the day with? Here's Jack Aroot. Keith, so far, it's somewhat of a non-story. Now, this is the pile of tires that have already come off the race cars, and the uh, teams have elected not to use them anymore. But if you take a look over here at Goodyear, well, they look like the loneliest people in town. They're not doing anything. Back here at Hoosier, just about likewise. Everything seems to be running fairly well for both sets of tires. So. We, we think so far that it's not going to be much of a story. Maybe at the end it will be. Let's go back to you. And Jeff Bodine off the racetrack, down on the inside, making his turn down towards pit road. So Jeff Bodine, the pole sitter and uh, record maker in qualifying, has run into some trouble under green. And you run laps here under green at 32, 33 seconds. So this could be very costly. And apparently they will they will raise the hood on that car, Keith. And uh, you see some of the some of the crews there timing some laps. But Jeff put I and having a tough break. Waddell Wilson and the crew having raised the hood on the car. And again, the pole sitter hoping to pick up his first win in about two years. And they slowly put the hood down, and it will be probably a long day. They will begin to push that car back to the garage area. Meantime, old pal Benny Parsons continues to lead the race, and I'm sure that he is. As uh, you might say in the backyard, getting his enjoys right here because it's been a long time since he's been up there. He's in his mid 40s, and in a conversation, he points out that power steering has been an asset for many drivers to continue their careers. Oh, I don't know. When I was in my mid 20s, and I thought about when, how long I could drive a race car. For some reason, the magic number of 40. You know, look, I got at 40. I got to quit this business. I'm 46 years old. I mean, I went by 40 like it wasn't even there. I'm 46 years old now, and I look at Bobby Allison, 50 years old, winning the Daytona 500. I look at Richard Petty, still doing it. I look at Herschel McGriff, who is, you know, in his late 50s, or at least mid 50s, maybe late 50s, and he's still doing it and still doing a good job. I really, truly don't know where the end is, and it's simply because of a few things like power steering and the cool suits something to keep you cool and to make the effort a little less. Benny Parsons, who had his first career start in the 1969 Daytona 500, I remember, and he finished eighth. You know, Keith, back in the 60s, a lot of drivers would retire at the age of 33 or 35, and that was because of the feedback in these cars, and Benny points up something very important. With the power steering on the car, you can sit there all day and drive it, and you don't get tired. Also, your head doesn't get tired. They have a new carbon fiber helmet that weighs about a third of what the original helmets used to wear, weigh, so you don't, your neck doesn't get tired. You can hold your head up and watch where you're going. A lot of them, they have earplugs they wear now, little individual speakers that keep the noise out of the car, so you're not deaf by the time you're 30 years old or 35, so a lot of guys still running. Your Petty's 50. Boy, I hear at 53. And, and look Earnhardt. at Earnhardt. He's about to take him. Earnhardt has worked his way from 17th, and now he is door handling Benny Parsons, and he has the low ride. And when Earnhardt gets you on the hip like that, it's sooner or later, see you later. And he got him right there. Let's put a clock on them and see what they're doing. They look quick. Of course, you know you can run out in front by yourself so long, you start hearing cranky sounds. It's sometimes a lot of guys will like to have people come on and give them some company and maybe give them a little relief in drafting. But the problem you have with Earnhardt is running with him. And he's right now about to run away from Benny Parsons as you see the time of 33-3 and the speed 164-541. 
Not a bad speed. You consider the fact they qualified about 176 miles an hour. It's about 10 miles an hour slower than they qualified, but now they have the race set up, and we've got 115 laps of rubber on the racetrack, which makes the track awfully slick. So you got to be careful. You can't dance around too wildly. You end up getting a little bit of concrete in that grill. So Dale Earnhardt made that cruise from 17th to 1st in almost leisurely fashion. And Kyle Petty dropping to third, Rick Wilson four, and Rusty Wallace now running in the number five position, and we are at 116 laps. You talked about how Benny Parsons has got to be smiling. His car owner, a fellow who's probably one of the most likable guys in NASCAR, is named Judy Dunleavy. Now, Judy's approximately 68, maybe 70 years old. He's somewhat of a cross between uh, Bob Hope and Gabby Hayes. Everyone loves to talk to Judy. He's such a friendly guy. He's hilarious to talk to. And you know, he's been at it for about 30 years in racing, but he only has one victory to his credit. That win coming in 1981 at Dover, Delaware. And I was there, and I tell you, Keith, when that car came down, down pit road, every crew in the pit stood to give a standing ovation to Dunlavey's crew and that car getting his only win. Well, Junior's first win was back in 1953 when he won the Southern 500, number 12. That's Bobby Allison, and he's still very much in the hunt. Bobby and I running in the number five spot. That yellow car in front, that's Rick Wilson, number four, and Allison comes cruising up on the outside, and looks like Bobby in the Buick is going to take a shot at him. Bobby, of course, beat his son, Davey, to win the Daytona 500. physical conditioning and a lot of people are going to sit down and argue that uh, whether or not you have to be an athlete to drive a race car. The only thing I can tell you is about most of these people if you're going to shake hands with them take your ring off on your right hand because they are the forearms from so many years of wrestling 4,000 pound automobiles around. They are so strong it's incredible. They did a survey a couple of years ago. One of the better sports medicine companies in the country took some stock car drivers and tried to decide what really makes these guys athletes. And they said, well, is the reaction time any quicker than a basketball player? And it really wasn't. Do they, uh, are they stronger than football players? And they're really not. What they did find out was that they, a, a stock car driver, Keith, can look at a record going around on a record player and read the label where no one else could do it. Is that right? It's an impressive thing to see. They took Phil Parsons and a few other young drivers and put a record on, on a record player and kept turning the speed up on the record and they continued to read the label as they changed record after record and could read what was going on with that record. Got to have an edge to run at this pace. Jeff Bodine, bad luck for the pole sitter. Jack Aroot with him. Jeffrey, you finally took the helmet off and you're unstrapping yourself out of the car. What was the problem? Well, that means we burned a piston. That means we can't get back out there. You can't fix a piston uh, if it's been a valve or something. We might have been able to get back out there and just run around and get some points, but that's been a tough year, I mean, for points. We're running really good, Jackie, and uh, thought we had a chance at it. You know, Dale's running good. The 90 car, look at Benny Parson. He's yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, kind of unusual to see Benny run this strong. Is it track conditions? Has he got his act together? Is there something you saw out there about that? Well, it isn't strange to see Benny run that good. He's a great driver. But you don't usually see that Don Levy car that strong in these races. He'll just kind of lay back and go at the end, but he's strong out there, and uh, that's that's exciting. You know, I'm excited to see him go that good. Of course, my brother's out there, and I'm pulling for him now. Uh, we thought starting on a pole might be lucky for us here. Ten guys have won from the pole position. But ten guys have won from starting fifth, and that's where Brett started. So we're behind him right now. Hi, Dad. I hope your back's feeling better. Barry, Matthew, we'll be home in a little while. <laughs> well, another driver that's giving a lot of excitement right now is Dale Earnhardt, and Jerry Gaffins is down in his pit. There with Richard Childress. Richard, Dale looks like he's running on rails right now. Where is he getting all the speed right now? Well, the car is working pretty good handling, you know, but Benny Parsons, he's running good. Uh, you know, it's still the, the racetrack changes here, and we're just trying to chase the racetrack right now. And, so far, we've been able to hit at each stop. Going from 17th up to first that fast, how much of it is Dale Earnhardt and how much of it is Richard Childress's race car? I think everybody can see Dale Earnhardt did that driving out there. He just, you know, all the spectators were watching the car. It's Dale. You're already planning now for the latter stages of the race with tires. What's the situation with your Goodyear tires right now? Well, we just want to try to make sure we've got enough of stickers, you know, to work with and be able to get the kind of stagger that we want to. Uh, 
take several sets to work through to get the combinations each team wants to run. Is good you're able to supply what you need right now? Yeah, so far I think everything's going to be okay. Okay, Richard Childress looking good with Dale Earnhardt out there behind the wheel of his car. Kind of interesting that Richard Childress uh, butted his head against the wall as a driver. Didn't have a whole lot of luck, but uh, he found his way into the ownership and the management area and uh, put together a group that is really something special. I mean, they are good. And the guy wheeling this thing around ain't bad. Of course, Dale is the son of Ralph, and Ralph uh, wore a few grooves and a lot of racetracks across the South himself. There's your running order through 123 of 328 laps in the Atlanta 500. We've got 20 cars on the lead lap in the Atlanta 500. We've run 129 laps. Dale Earnhardt is the leader. Fanny Parsons is hanging on to him, running in the number 20 spot, Bobby Hillen Jr. Means Bailey, Kulwicki, Davey Allison, Lake Speed, Phil Parsons, A.J. Foyt. Those are the people out of it. 20 on the lead lap. There's some others out. Teague and Reagan have joined those who have dropped out as well. And the pole sitter, Bodine, Jeff Bodine, you just heard from him a few moments ago. Keith, there's a uh the show of the way and Earnhardt uh, who led 195 laps in this race a year ago but didn't win it. The fellow who won the race last year of course was Ricky Rudd. He led only seven laps but it was the important seven. They were the final ones of the race. Let's continue our tire story here as the day wears on. Remember these people had the privilege of starting one and then changing if they so chose and let's check in again with Jack Arood on the subject. Well, Keith, actually, let's give it a change in the subject. You heard your crew chief for uh, Dale Earnhardt's car, Richard Childress, allude to the fact that they were looking for a set of tires to hold back. Here's how that takes place. These are all the tires that Benny Parsons has at his disposal for the remainder of the race. Now, what they've done is they've checked the circumference of each of these tires. And in this book, they have listed them, the outside circumferences, and they're beginning to develop a pattern as to what set works the best on the race car. From these sets, they will pick a set of tires that they'll hold back to the last pit stop. It's kind of like a game of the price is right, but this time the key is being able to guess the right circumference. Back up to you. Yeah, if you, you, you can't just arbitrarily take four tires and slap them on a car because you oftentimes are going to mess up your stagger because just because you have put four new tires on does not really mean that you have preserved the stagger. That's right, Keith. They measure these, these tires very carefully, and it's something else that they have to be concerned about is that the tires grow differently. They grow, they will expand to a different circumference once they are heated up. So what they will normally do is bring tires in during the week, and they will run them a few laps during practice. Now, once those tires are heated one time, they will grow to a certain circumference, and they will stay there. That's called a, what they call a, a tire that's been scuffed in. Now, a brand new tire or a sticker tire, that tire is going to grow. and They don't really know how much it'll grow. So later in the race, when they're having to use brand new tires or sticker tires, they will be guessing a lot more than they are right now. Sterling Marlin gave up a pretty good spot, overshot his pit, and on lap 133 had to go back around, and now he's come back into the pit. So, you know, that it's a responsibility. The phone rings at both ends in this case. You expect the crew to respond uh, as quickly as possible. But in the case of Sterling, it may not make a whole lot of difference because the hood has now come up on his car on pit road. But he did miss the pit the first time and uh, had to come back around another time. He is right now second in point, so this is important. Benny Parsons is in the pits. Let's take, right, a look at, let's take a look at Benny's pit stop here. A scheduled stop for Benny Parsons. Doug Reichert and the crew bring the car to a halt. Cleaning that windshield. We'll watch at pit time and see how long it takes them to change those two right side tires. Now, under green flag conditions, the race is going on right now. They will only change two tires on the right side. Benny Parsons' car down off the jack. 12.6 second super pit stop for Doug Reichert and the crew. Dale Earnhardt coming around, Benny trying to get out, get speed, and uh, keep Earnhardt from putting him down one. Earnhardt closing right in behind him. If Earnhardt passes him, Parsons is down. That's the problem you got with uh, pit stop under the green. There goes Earnhardt, going to go by him, and he's a lap down if he stays there. 
Well, you see the difference in those tires there. Earnhardt has tires that are basically getting worn considerably now after rushing up through all that traffic and now getting toward the front. And you see Benny Parsons with fresh rubber. He just says, adios, Mr. Earnhardt. He pulls him by 10 car lengths on the front stretch. So Parsons, uh, Earnhardt got him even. And then Benny put him away. So Parsons is still running on the lead lap. Rick Wilson had to come in and make a pit stop as well under the green. Earnhardt is yet to make a green stop. But he's, uh, he's close to one. Jerry Gappins tells us that Earnhardt is within two or three laps of having to come in under the green himself. So that will be to the advantage of many Parsons and all of the others who are out there. As Earnhardt comes in, that will put Petty, Kyle Petty, into the lead. And let's look back here and see where uh, King Richard's running now. Richard is in number eight spot. He's been pretty quiet so far today, but he's still right there. And so is Bobby Allison running fifth in car number 12. There's Earnhardt going around the car of Neil Bonnet, his good friend and hunting buddy. They go deer hunting together a lot, and uh, he's been chasing Bonnet all year long, and now it's the, the tables are reversed in the first three races. And Earnhardt it goes by, and he will put Neil Bonnet a lap down. And as the leader goes by, you take a look out of the camera inside Neil Bonnet's car, and you can see now that the visibility is already becoming something of a problem. That's why they are so quick to scrub those windscreens when they come in. But as the day goes on and you run into this area of the racetrack, turns three and four, and the sun starts settling down over there, you hit a blind spot. And I mean, it's scary. Because you're plummeting along at 165 miles an hour, and for a fraction of a second, you're almost blind as that sun gets down on the horizon. You see Dale Earnhardt's car slipping out a little bit in front of Neil Bond. There's a shot of Neil. He's just leaning to the left and turning that wheel. You don't want to jerk that steering wheel. You want to be very smooth with it. Here's Kyle Petty, second place car down pit road. And the Fame Wood Brothers going to work on the car. Leonard Wood, the right front tire. That's Eddie and Len Wood, who are the sons of the patriarch of the Wood family. That's Glenn Wood who is actively involved. Glenn standing there in the pit area. Leonard getting that right front tire put on. They will pull the jack out, and he is away. Here comes the leader, Dale Earnhardt. Down Pretty good pit stop, 14.36 seconds for the Woods brothers. Earnhardt now to his pit. Watch these guys. Right side tires on the Earnhardt crew. That's Kirk Shelverdine, the crew chief, putting the right front tire on. David Smith, the jack man, stands up, makes sure both tires are on, and Smith will grab that jack and give it a twist, watching that fuel go in. Good stop, 13 seconds flat for the leader, Dale Earnhardt. Yellow flag. How about that? Timing in life is everything, isn't it? Earnhardt comes in under green while he's in the pits. Yellow comes out. And it's Mark Martin who has caused the yellow. Mark Martin from Batesville, Arkansas. He had been running up toward the front, Keith, and uh, he had moved all the way up to fifth spot after a good qualifying effort. And apparently he was trying to stretch it a little bit too far. We talked about tire wear. Apparently he cut a tire down and tagged that wall coming out of turn four. Mark, the runner-up in the 82 NASCAR Winston Cup Rookie of the Year Championship, getting back into cup racing and running into a bit of bad luck in the Atlanta 500. Yellow out, lap 142. At yellow, you could have put Parsons perhaps a lap down. Is that not right? It's possible, but there were some other cars still in the lead lap. We, we wouldn't have been out there by ourselves or anything. So you're pretty happy with the, the exchange here during this yellow then? Yeah, when you get caught in the pits like that, it's always an edgy deal. You, you know, we stood a chance to lose some ground right there. We were just lucky to come out okay. Okay, Keith, they're happy down here with that turn of events. All right, Jerry, Jay Summers, a young man who ran in an ARCA race here yesterday. And uh, Jerry Gappins, that's a very different kind of a story because here's a young man who wants to race as much as anything. And what, he took 150 bucks of his paycheck and uh, went out and bought 150 lottery tickets and won $4.6 million in the Michigan lottery. Well, what he did, he's a 20-year-old he's kid from Sterling Heights, Michigan. That's him in the red car, the car number 78. And as you said, he had $150 left from his paycheck back in January. On the way home, he said, what the heck, I'll stop and he bought $151 lottery tickets. And four hours later, they made the drawing. Now, the drawing was for $28 million total, but there were other people who won as well. So he got $5.7 million. 5.7. After taxes, it was 4.6. So that's $230,000 a year for 20 years. He's going to spend it all trying to be a stock car driver, he said. 
Well, he didn't have a, a real big day. He finished 31st yesterday, and a moment of bad luck bit him, but he certainly got the wherewithal now to go racing if he has a hankering for it, doesn't he? You know, he, uh, he he had four days to go to Daytona. He bought a car from a veteran car owner, Hall Sellers, and went to Daytona, qualified the car impressively, qualified fourth, ran the entire ARCA 200, and finished fourth. All right, we've still got yellow out in the Atlanta 500 at lap 147 out of 328. We'll be back with more exclusive coverage after this commercial and the word from our local station. An ABC Sports exclusive being brought to you by Budweiser, proud sponsor of the 1988 U.S. Olympic team. This Bud's for you. By the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, no matter how far you go, Goodyear takes you home. By Ford and your Ford dealer, have you driven a Ford lately? And by Quality Choice, Comfort Inns, Quality Inns, and Clarion Hotel. Still under yellow, Dale Earnhardt is your leader. Rusty Wallace is second. Bobby Allison has now moved up to third. Ever so quietly, car number 12, winner of the Daytona 500 this year. Bobby Allison started back in the pack, Keith, started back in 27th spot, but he said that was a little bit deceiving because they had been running so well in practice. They had an ignition problem. They had a miss in the motor during their one and only qualifying lap they were allowed. And we might mention there was an abbreviated practice schedule because of the rains here on Friday and some of the inclement weather yesterday, so they had to get qualifying squeezed in. And some of these guys only had maybe a dozen or two laps of practice total prior to the start of the day's race. Next time around, we'll get a green flag coming up Saturday here on ABC. Shearson Lehman Hutton, the Lipton International Tennis Championships. Top tennis pro Steffi Graf is there. Jimmy Connors, Chrissy Everett, Matt Savilander. Coverage begins live except on the West Coast Saturday at 1 Eastern and Pacific, 12 Central on ABC Sports. Ready to go back to green. Uh, we're about 14 laps away from the halfway point. 164 laps will be halfway of this 328 lapper. And uh, Keith looks like Earnhardt's having everything his way early on, but they're all bunched up back there with fresh rubber. We'll see who can handle it now. Well, before we had all of the shuffling, uh, we had uh, 20 cars on the lead lap. And we're somewhere in the neighborhood of 1617 right now. So we'll we'll check them out. As uh, we wait for the green flag, you see Earnhardt there in the black car. Now we know that car number 23, Eddie Bierschwale, is not on the lead lap. But Rusty Wallace in car number 27 certainly is, and so is Bobby Allison. So there they'll go. Earnhardt, Wallace, Allison. Benny Parsons is tucked back in there. Benny is somewhere back around fourth or fifth. And Kyle Petty will be around fifth, I guess, and Benny would be fourth. Here's the green. Wallace is going right with him. Lead cars on the outside, the lap cars on the inside as now the lead cars begin to pull away. And uh, that's uh, Earnhardt again flexing the muscle. He's pulling away out of, out of turn two, a couple of car lengths. They pull away from Bobby Allison, who's running back in third spot. There's Allison. He didn't really seem to have the kick, did he? I mean, he just lost real quick a couple of three or four car length. and Earnhardt now just laying the muscle down right here. Talk about how much of a handling track Atlanta is but when they restart and you come up through the gearbox and come back to full speed it's all horsepower and you realize just how much power in that car number three of Dale Earnhardt. He just pulled already some ten car lengths on Rusty Wallace down the back stretch. Meanwhile that's Bobby Allison. That's a lap car of Rick Wilson. Uh, Wilson is not the fourth place car. Allison will be running in third, then Wilson's car, and then a battle back for fourth spot is Benny Parsons back there as he is trying to make a move. There is Benny Parsons as he is also in, a, with a, in front of a lap car. That's Eddie Beerswell. Parsons is the fourth place car. Right now, the Petties, uh, Kyle running fifth and Richard running sixth back at the pack. So this issue is far from resolution. We have 16 cars on the lead lap the speed of the leader, 170 plus miles an hour. Here are the Petties. Number 21 is Kyle driving the Woods Brothers car and uh, Richard in the familiar colors. Uh, red and blue. Richard's been rattled around a couple of wrecks this year, but 
his cowboy hat still hasn't fallen off. I tell you, you got to really admire, whether you're a Petty fan or not, Richard or Kyle, either one, you've got to admire Richard Petty's courage after what happened at Daytona. Dipsy doodling and dancing along six times. He flipped that car coming out of turn four. And I tell you, Richard Petty has come back. He came back a week later, finished third at Richmond, then had a hard slam at Rockingham a couple of weeks ago. So in two of his three starts this year, he has had accidents, and uh, he still climbs on the race car and goes as fast as any of them. Yeah, but you know, if you can do like it says what you say, it ain't bragging, and there ain't nobody in the book but one, Richard Petty, that has 200 firsts under his name. A couple of years ago, Keith, Richard had uh, his shoulder dislocated at Daytona in the first race of the year. He went up across the track and into the wall, and the roll bar actually pushed his right shoulder out of the socket out backwards. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I was in his truck at Richmond, and uh, you know, being a physician, I spent an hour taping Richard up before that race uh, as a favor to him, and he couldn't even raise his right arm. In fact, they had to raise the seat up in the car for him to be able to get his right hand on the shifter to switch to change gears. And yet he ran for 400 laps on a half-mile racetrack for three and a half hours and never set a peak. His first Winston Cup Grand National start was 1958 in Toronto, July. His first win came February 28, 1960 on a dirt track in Charlotte. But there was another time, I think in 1959, where he was racing with his daddy. And uh, Richard came across first, and Lee filed a protest, and won the protest, and bumped Richard out of first and took over first himself. So. Uh, the, the, this Petty family has that been, been racing a long time. That would have been Richard's first win. That would have been his first career right. win, and his daddy took it away from him. Whoa, Richard getting a little bit high. Just a little sheet metal exchange there with Eddie Beersquall's car. They bump again going into turn one, so they're at 165, 170 miles an hour, swapping a little bit of paint. There's Richard Petty and, of course, Bill Elliott. Uh, change as time wears on, time being the greatest thief of all for all of us. Victories don't come as often, and we put that question to Richard and asked him if it bothers him. He said, well, I think it's probably tougher on somebody that's used to winning than it is for people that just win now and then anyway. So they can sort of uh, adapt to it a little bit easier. But, you know, if you, if you went through your whole career and won consistent like we have over the years, and then all of a sudden you run a couple of years and don't win a race. You say, hey, man, you know, is it me? Is it the car? Is it the circumstances? And, you know, it always falls back on you uh, and uh, or on me uh, in this particular instance. And, and you say, okay, you know, what can I do to help my ability? What can I do to help the team? What can I do to to make the whole thing come back together like what it used to be? And, uh, you know, you know that... As time progresses, uh, society changes, the racing people change, the race cars change. So you know it, it can't be like it was five years ago or 10 years ago. But you do feel like that you still got the talent enough to get in there and be consistent with it and win a few races. And, uh, you know, after you've won 200 races, then all I need to do is win one or two a year and I'll be okay. But I haven't been able to do that lately. He won 10 straight in 67. He won 27 out of 46 starts in 1967 season. That's something. He's been around a long time. One of my, somebody was telling a story yesterday about a young uh, lady television producer one time. Uh, Richard was sitting in the studio for an interview. Of course, with that cowboy hat on and those dark glasses, uh, they wanted to see what he looked like. So she went over and uh, suggested he take off his hat and glasses before somebody grabbed her and said, you can't do that. That's him. <laughs> That's one of his trademarks. At, at, at those glasses, he never takes them off. Inside for the interview, he wouldn't take them off, and uh, he likes to wear them all the time. Right now, it's the Dale Earnhardt Show. He has been back in 17, fought his way back to the front in an almost leisurely fashion. Uh, he got a bit of luck in the last yellow, and uh, he's running off now. He's led 128 of the 162 laps that we've run. Car number three looks like it is the muscle car of this Atlanta 500. And Keith, Benny Parsons is moving up a little bit. He has gone around Bobby Allison and taken over third spot, and Parsons now starting to reel in the second place car of Rusty Wallace. Benny Parsons, who led earlier in the afternoon and came out uh, running in fifth or sixth as they restarted the race, has now shuffled around the third place car of 
Bobby Allison and trying to move in some on walk. But there's still a long way to go. Benny Parsons stays in hot pursuit. 1976 was Dale Earnhardt's first start here in Atlanta. And he did not uh, go to victory lane. He actually had a collision with Dick Brooks. And he flipped end over end over end over end over end over end. And it took a couple of three days for him to get his eyes refocused after that adventure. We've now hit the halfway point. And it's Earnhardt, Wallace, Parsons, Bobby Allison, and Kyle Petty. Here's Jack Aroot. Keith, here's a story on Bobby Allison's car. You know, they say if there's a lot of cautions, the one man that can do more to fix and adjust a car is Bobby Allison. Well, he's come from 27th on the grid to run in fourth position, but Jimmy Fenning is his crew chief, and Jimmy, we understand you went back to the Goodyear trailer to get some extra tires, and they said, sorry, we're sold out. Yeah, I guess Goodyear ran out of tires. I don't know if we got enough stickers left in a pits, but we got about three more sets of scuffs, so we'll just see if we can make it to the end. Did you let Bobby know that? Is maybe that why he just dropped out of the throttle just a bit because you're going to have to conserve not fuel but tires? No, he uh, the car is pushing a little bit, and in the last stop we tried loosening it up, but uh, I don't think we got it just enough. You know, tires accounted for one of the major victories that we saw here on ABC. Remember last year at the Firecracker 400? Bobby Allison elected to take four brand new tires with just a handful of laps to go, and he won that Firecracker. Well, I would think that uh, the fellows who are out of the race who might have had some uh, tires stockpiled in their pit area would be in a pretty good bargaining position right now, wouldn't it? Would you oh, be exactly. Able? That's exactly that's how it works, Keith. When they, when they run out of tires, many of the teams have probably mounted up six, seven, eight, some of the teams uh, nine sets of tires. That's $700 a set. Now, when a car falls out of the race now, it looks like uh, dropping crumbs at a picnic. Ants will begin to swarm around that car as members from every crew up and down pit road will be there bidding to buy their tires. So a guy who falls out could probably make more money by falling out of the race now and selling his tires to the highest bidder. Cash on the right. right. Cash. <laughs> Cash on the barrel head. Right. All right, Betty Parsons now has moved in behind Rusty Wallace close enough to be in a challenging position to regain second place. Benny led uh, for a relatively brief time and uh, ran very, very well. He's still running very well and he's looking now for the timing and the placing in an effort to make a pass of Wallace for second place. In the meantime, Earnhardt is long gone. Rusty Wallace has a couple of short track wins. He has two road course wins, but he has never been able to put up the victory flag on one of the uh, oval super speedways. The car Rusty has here, Keith, is the same car he ran in the Daytona 500 back in February. He finished seventh at Daytona in the 500. In fact, this car finished second in one of the qualifying races there. So it's a pretty stout race car. They built uh, the shops. And there, of course, is Neil Bonnet uh, in the pits. And that would be an unscheduled stop. Yep. Bob Rahilly and the crew going beneath the hood uh, of that car. And that certainly doesn't look good for Neil Bonnet. Jack Arruda is standing by the Neil Bonnet pit. Jack? And we checked with Butch Mock before they went over the wall. And they said that Neil radioed in and said there was something amiss with the engine. And if you can listen here, that's definitely the case. It's not firing the way it should be. Bob Rahilly is the man that builds the engines for this team. Bob, what's the story? You've taken a look under the hood. What's the problem with the motor? Uh, I don't know. It's uh, pushing a little oil out to breathe. There's a little smoke. It looks like uh, possibly we could have burned a pistol. Not a good sign for making a victory. Now what are you going to do? Just have to ride out the rest of the day? Uh, we're just going to try to ride it out and get the many points as we can. Points are very important. Not victories now for Neil Bonnet, just points. Well, he is at a position where if he does have to give it up and he has not reached any kind of speed on the back straight at all, uh, he conceivably could lose his points lead in this race. He probably will lose the points lead, and he is, again, very, very slow. You see Bobby Hillen's car going by, and uh, running on seven or so cylinders, uh, he will not be able to last the, remain the remainder of the afternoon. And there is the leader, of course, the, the Chevrolet of Dale Earnhardt. He's in front, followed by Benny Parsons now, who has gone back to second place, passing Rusty Wallace, Bobby Allison, and Kyle Petty. And there's your second grouping of five. 
Bradford Hart continues to lead the Atlanta 500. Betty Parsons is running just under five seconds behind him, like 4.8. And Parsons right now running right at 164 miles an hour. You see that Earnhardt uh, got out of the blocks a little bit slow this year. But uh, it's just taken them a little longer time uh, than one might have thought because they've gone through some changes. You must make changes, obviously. And uh, the way they're running today, I expect you'll be hearing a whole lot of Dale and uh, Richard Childress and that much in the weeks to come. But he's running right now just like he is on rails. And uh, the standings, as we gave them to you, look like this. Bobby Allison tuck it away now. He started way back there in the pack, but he's sitting right in among the crowd right now. And uh, Darrell Waldrop has uh, moved up into that number five spot. Kentucky beat Maryland today in 9081, so the Wildcats stay alive, beating Bob Wade's ball club today. Wildcats continue to look like they might be on their way to a Final Four. But here's a guy that is on his way right now, running so very well. There's the Kentucky score again over Maryland. Uh, Maryland having finished fifth in the Atlantic Coast Conference this year. An impressive postseason effort uh, the night. Uh, Derek Lewis and the guys uh, for Bob Wade couldn't quite do it over Kentucky, but Earnhardt's doing it right now here at Atlanta. You know, we mentioned he won 11 times last year, but Earnhardt is on a winless streak. He has been spent 10 races since he's won a race. Uh, his last win coming at Richmond in September of 87. So he's gone throughout the winter months and the first three events of 88 without a win. And he's certainly headed toward that possible win today here at Atlanta. Got a scrap going on now for the number five position, and it's between Daryl Waltrip, number 17, and Kyle Petty, number 21. Here's another fellow that'd like to break a string, too, Daryl Waltrip. He's been in races in which he has certainly been competitive, run very well, but just hasn't had enough kick to put it across first. And uh, he's in a position at this point of the race, having uh, reached 180 laps now, where he can probably see a light at the end of the tunnel. But something's going to happen to Dale Earnhardt if anybody else is going to win this race because right now and over the last hour he has been so clearly dominant. The Alabama gang. Donnie uh, Allison uh, just missed qualifying for the Atlanta 500. He had a ride and uh, because of the limited practice time, uh, that I think probably uh, hurt several people. And I think in Donna's case, it was one of the factors that led to him just failing to qualify for the Atlanta 500. Bobby Allison, man of adventure, curious. He takes him all kinds of places, racetrack, and in particular, airplanes. Jack Aroot has the story. For over a quarter of a century, Bobby Allison has flown his own airplane. But what started out as a means of expeditious travel has become a passionate search for improvement. In typical Allison fashion, Bobby now looks at flying through the eyes of an inventor. I uh, do a lot of sketching and, and a lot of um, thinking on paper as I fly along. But then uh, as I've done some things, people have seen them and been interested. And they're talking now about possibly uh, doing a supplemental type certificate uh, for some of the things that we've done here to uh, allow other people to put them into use also. The pet project for this year's Daytona 500 winner is an experimental twin-engined airplane, which Bobby has personally modified with turbochargers normally found on helicopters. This aeronautical experiment is a marked departure from his Sunday drives on the stock car circuit, one that Bobby welcomes. Well, what happens is the situation that I'm more in control of right now. Here in the hangar, I'm able to go in with uh, Chuck Stallings, who works hand in hand with me and seems to also understand me and say, let's do this. And we have complete control over whatever activity we're doing. It doesn't depend on uh, a manufacturer that, that uh, is in competition with some other manufacturer from the car standpoint, the engine standpoint. Uh, from regulations, from uh, somebody in a hangar next door, uh, 
or any of those things that, that come into the racing picture. You have to do all those things every day. Be it wheels or wings, Bobby Allison is always searching for an advantage, something that'll give him an edge and keep him soaring to new heights. That's a far cry from the dirt track days when he first moved into Hueytown and started racing. Bobby incidentally holds what you might call the Joe DiMaggio record in NASCAR from September 6th of 1971 through October 22nd of 1972. That man led in 39 consecutive Winston Cup events. And he's third, he's third, third uh, winningest driver in the history of NASCAR, just behind uh, Penny, who won 200, and Pearson with 105, and Allison's win at Daytona last month makes him 84 wins for third overall in the rankings. Now let's go to Jerry Gaffins. We're with Leo Mel, the director for the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. And Leo, you've been a busy man here today, walking up and down pit road. First question we have, we've been talking about Bobby Allison here. He's running very strong, but there seems to be some concern from his pit whether or not there are enough what they call sticker tires for him to go the rest of the race. Can Goodyear supply him with what he needs tire-wise? Yeah, we have plenty of tires. Uh, there was a big run on them, obviously, this weekend. Uh, they, the engineers have done a great job creating a new tire, and it's been in big demand. Okay, now you've gotten into a subject where we've been talking about this all day. They came and declared war, and the racetrack has become the battleground for you guys, and you went back up and rolled your sleeves and got to work. How, how much time did that take to get the decision to get everything done that needed to be done for Goodyear on this? We started right after Rockingham, and they produced a brand new tire, new molds, over 1,200 tires in a total of two weeks. So it was a it was very good job. How does Goodyear look at this competition? Is this good and healthy for the sport, or is this cause of concern? Uh, we think it's great. We, it gets everybody on their toes. Uh, we we'd won over 500 races, so you get just a little bit. You need some competition. That's what racing's all about, and we're really enjoying it. Okay, one problem somebody hasn't really addressed here is the fact that NASCAR has been trying to slow these cars down for the last couple of years, and you've been helping them a little bit. You haven't been building real fast tires. Now you're sort of forced to have to build some faster tires. Is this going to drive the speeds up in stock car racing? Yeah, it sure is. We've been trying to go along with NASCAR, but now our number one job is to win. Okay, let's go down to pit road now with Jack Aroot. Jerry, I've done a survey of the top three cars that are still in competition to check just how many of those sticker tires remain that they can use in the second half of the race. Ironically, every single team has the same number. Six sets rest back here behind their pit area, ready to go on the car. But the question mark remains, who has the best set? Because contrary to what Leo Mel says, there are no tires left to be mounted on rims back at Goodyear. They are out of tires for this weekend, so what you've got back here is what you're going to have to run for the rest of the afternoon. Let's go back up topside. Okay, Jack, the interval now between the leader, Dale Earnhardt, there in car number three, and Benny Parsons in car number nine is 6.7 seconds. Allison back in fourth, and Walter running five. The Atlanta 500 will be back. That's car number 99. Connie Saylor out of Johnson City, Tennessee, coming into the pits. And something caught fire. It's created this big pall of smoke. And that's right down near the front end of Pit Road. The car is now off behind the wall and out of the way. But it has put a pall of smoke over the whole uh, start-finish line area. You have 12 cars on the lead lap. You have uh, 28 cars left running out of a starting field of 42, so that means 14 of them are out. And they, as you see now, have the fire under control. Some sort of a fire bursting out uh, around the engine area. Oil, and of course, oil causes all that blue smoke. We might mention that's the car that Dale Jarrett started today. Jarrett starting that car in place of Connie Saver, the driver who qualified it, so Jarrett could stay up in the point race. But uh, we saw Connie climb out of the car and appeared to be okay, but. Uh, and we're going to look for green flag pit stops coming up pretty soon. Here may be the first one. Rusty, Rusty Wallace. Wallace. Yep. Rusty Wallace coming into the pits under the green, and Jack Roots going to watch what happens. 
Rusty Wallace locks up the car. The crew goes to work. Now they're going to change outside rubber. That's fairly normal under green flag conditions. They're making the exchange right now. Now Rusty has to keep the wheels straight, keep the car in neutral. Now he puts it back in first gear, and he's off and away. A very quick stop for Rusty Wallace. Fairly normal under green flag conditions. Back to you. Just under 12 seconds, 11.69. Uh, I'd say that's quick indeed. Good stop for Barry Dotson and the crew, and it looks like the uh, crew for Dale Earnhardt is scampering around on pit road as they're getting ready for Earnhardt to come down. They have the pit board out waiting for him to come off for the corner. He's uh, bringing the car down low to the banking, goes around the slowing car of Neil Bonnet, and this time he will not come down pit road, but he will signal this time by to the crew as they wave him in. Richard Petty plummeting down pit road and making a stop now as Richard comes in he's sitting in the number nine spot so he's going to give up a little room out on the racetrack got another basketball final for you Vanderbilt in overtime Vandy 80 Pittsburgh 74 so that I am sure is going to rattle some folks in the east big win for CM Newton Vanderbilt now here comes your leader Dale Earnhardt on pit road. Cecil Gordon and the rest of the crew waiting for Earnhardt to bring the car. And remember, Wallace now took on right side tires, and apparently, likewise, will Earnhardt as the crew go to work on the right side. David Smith has the jack. Will Lynn, the right rear tire. The crew chief, Kirk Shelburne, already has peeled that right front tire away. They are checking the left side tires, and there's the car owner Childers on the wall watching everything happen. Now there'll be a four tire change. They will put fresh rubber all the way around. Earnhardt is so quick that apparently they can afford to take the time under green to change all four tires. Pretty hard to change four tires, though, in less than 20 seconds, and uh, Earnhardt didn't. He took 21.76 seconds. Benny Parsons coming around. Parsons should go by him in turn one as. Uh, Earnhardt pulling up on the racetrack, but now Earnhardt really coming back to speed, and then we widen out and see Parsons uh, in the right side of your screen. Earnhardt has already gone back to speed. Fresh rubber makes all the difference here. Yeah, he really jumped on it. Looked like for a moment that Benny was going to be able to nail him and put him down one, but not so. Uh, Richard Petty, incidentally, 18.3 uh, seconds for his stop, but Earnhardt's crew electing to go for the four tires and. Uh, with uh, Parsons coming around, uh, Benny was trying to put him down, but you see the muscle in that black car. I mean, he just blew out and was long gone. That's a Chevrolet that uh, Earnhardt is driving. And Benny Parsons, in car number 90, is running Junie Donlevy's Ford. I guess Junie's always had 90, hasn't he? I, as far as I can remember back. That's been his number for a number for a lot of years, and uh, he likes the he likes the number. And uh, Parsons should be getting ready to pit in a few laps, but right now he's the leader here at Atlanta. He's... And we are at 203 laps. It is Parsons, Allison, Daryl Waltrip, Kyle Petty, and Terry Labonte in the top five. Jeep designs into the pits, pitting under green. We'll keep an eye on Parsons' pit stop and see where Dale Earnhardt is. Of course, Bobby Allison now will be the leader. There's Mike Walter pulling out. There's Allison in the lower left of your screen. As Parsons pulls back on the speedway, Allison has not pitted as of yet. Earnhardt, remember, was in the pits a minute ago for four tires, right side tires only for Benny Parsons. And Bobby Allison, leader of the Alabama gang at Daytona 500 winner, currently being shown as a leader here at Atlanta. 14 second pit stop for Benny Parsons. Very efficient. And right now, Dale Earnhardt, uh, and he's he was showing a lap down, and that would have put him back into the lead lap. So Earnhardt now will pick up run for the moment at least in 10th place with Bobby Allison in front. But again, keep in mind that Bobby's got to hit the pitch pretty quick. So does Walter. So does Kyle Petty. So does LeBunny. So does Brett Bodine. We haven't called Brett Bodine's name in a while. You know what? He's still sitting right up in there. About that fire we saw a few minutes ago, as others now are making their way to the pits, but none of the leaders. Here's Jerry Gappins. We're with Connie Saylor, the guy that's driving the car when it caught on fire. What happened there, Connie? Well, we had a brake problem earlier. The brake pedal built up on the car, become solid. We came in and stopped, finally got the car stopped, fixed it. We thought it went back out and it built up again. I guess the brake fluid got on fire. 
Okay, Connie Saylor, break foot on fire. Nobody injured in this mess, but a lot of smoke, Keith Jackson. Here comes the leader, Bobby Allison, into the pits. 50-year-old Bobby Allison moving down pit road, and Jimmy Finnegan, the rest of the crew, Bobby's son-in-law, Pat Broyles, and the rest of the crew down there. This is the Volo Brothers Racing Team go to work on the Bobby Allison car. We'll put the clock on it there, right side tires. That's Pat Broyles putting the jack underneath the car. They have the car jacked up. Pardon me, that's Scott Beam now jacking the car. They're cleaning the windshield. They will adjust the spoiler on the rear of the car. There they come around. Pat Broyles, the right front tire change, adding every drop of fuel. They drop it off the jack, 15.8 seconds, but very important to wait and get all that fuel in the car. All right, Bobby on his way. Shuffling continues and it gets shuffled pretty quick when uh, you're running under green and you got to come in for fuel. Richmond beat Georgia Tech today, 59 55. So the Richmond Spiders continue to be quite an NCAA basketball story and certainly the University of Rhode Island has been a whale of a story. All right, number 17 is Darrell Walter. He's currently the leader, Keith, and he will bring that uh, bright orange, uh, white numeral car, Chevrolet down pit road. And Jeff Hammond and the crew will be waiting on him as he makes his way down pit road. There's the final score. Richmond impressive after eliminating the Indiana Hoosiers. They eliminate Georgia Tech and Bobby Kremen's crowd. But here is Walter in the pits, and Jack Arood is there. Jack? Well, Darrell Walter brings his car, and he waves off the water in the, in the cold towel, so he's definitely just running along just very nicely. They look under the car on the left side to check and see the tire wear, but they're going to take right side tires only, and he's away. The thing Jerry punched that has confused everybody is Dale Earnhardt's electing to take four tires on. Each and every crew me member has managed to confer whether they should go over four or two because of Dale Earnhardt. Let's go back up to you. That's very interesting indeed, and Kyle Petty just slams the brakes on in that car number 21 and skitters to a halt, and the Wood Brothers are going to work on his car. He is one of the cars in the lead lap and has been among the leaders all afternoon, and Leonard Wood again changing that right front tire and Glenn's two sons. They pull that jack, and he is down and away. Pretty good pit stop for Kyle Petty, even though he skittered into the pits 14.6 seconds. Well, you're talking about Earnhardt uh, and taking on the four tires. Uh, Terry Labonte is going to give up the lead here in a minute. In fact, right now, because he's coming into the pit. Labonte has led only eight laps this year, and he's driving Junior Johnson's car. When you say Junior Johnson, you normally think quality, but they haven't had a particularly good year so far, and all of those have been under the eight laps he's led have been under caution or else in, during the exchange of pit stops. But he's in the pits right now. Earnhardt has... Uh, all of a sudden, because of the stops under the green, bounce right back in the lead. So I don't know if uh, Richard Childress, uh, at this particular moment, you can't say that they made a bad decision. They got four. They got four shoes. Well, and, you got the, uh, the other folks only have two. There's the leader. There's Taylor Earnhardt back out front. And as Jack Arute said, everyone else taking on two tires. Earnhardt comes in and takes the extra eight or nine seconds to put four fresh tires on the car, and is still in the lead. So it continues the Earnhardt Show at the Atlanta 500 with 213 laps in the books. There are your leaders. Dale Earnhardt back in front. Benny Parsons, Rusty right there. Rusty Wallace, Darrell Waltrip, and Kyle Petty. And Bobby Allison uh, is uh, right behind Kyle Petty in the number six position. But this big black Chevy is rolling right along and we'll pick up the other side of this tire story now the Hoosier tire out of Indiana the man that owns the company is Bob Newton and here he is with Jerry Gappins Bob you're the man that woke up sleeping the sleeping giant in Akron Ohio you've had some success the first three races but here today kind of taking it on the chin a little bit what do you think about what's happened today with Goodyear bringing in the new tires well yep. I don't know that we're really taking it on the chin. I thought before I came here, this was going to be a tough track, and it's, uh, it's uh, showed out to be a tough track. That's all. What will you do for the next race? You have to pretty much concede this one, it looks like, to, uh, to Goodyear. Of course, you didn't have a lot of drivers either start on Hoosier tires. What will you do to change that at Darlington next week now? Well, I think we're geared. We're, we're probably geared a lot better for next week, but I uh, tested here twice, and I really wasn't satisfied after I got done testing. But I just done the best we could. What what makes you think you're be better geared for next week? Well, I guess we'll have to wait and see, huh? 
Does this discourage you at all, the fact that Goodyear went back to the drawing board, the board meetings, and they had the production people go ahead and work on it? A, a little guy like Bob Newton up in Lakeville, Indiana, certainly doesn't have the resources that a Goodyear tire and rubber company has. What do you do to stay competitive now for the rest of this NASCAR season? Well, I think you have to watch that week to week. I think we'll be all right. We're talking about this year now. What's Bob Newton see for the Hoosier Tire Company five years from now? You going to stay in this sport for good? Oh, yeah. This is permanent. This is, uh, heck, we just started. We'll get better every week. Okay, Bob Newton, the president of Hoosier Tire. He's a caper. You know, uh, Hoosier is not a, a newcomer. They, they've been in business 25 years. In fact, this is their 25th anniversary. And in all fairness to Bob Newton, uh, they have gone to school last year on the Grand National Division. That's the AAA division or AAA ball division uh, of NASCAR, the one rung below this Winston Cup division. And they ran a lot of racetracks, and they don't run here in Atlanta. The Grand National cars don't. So they run at Rockingham and run at Darlington. So Hoosiers' research has been done primarily with those cars. And so that's why they were so strong at Richmond and, and Rockingham and probably will be strong next week at Darlington. All right, the leader is Dale Earnhardt. Here's the man running the show, Richard Childress with Jack LaRue. You were one of the teams, the only team in that last series of stops that elected to take on four tires. Now, what was the thinking behind that? Well, we had about a seven second lead and we wanted to just take a look, see what they all looked like at one time. And uh, so that's the reason we chose to go with four. All right, what did they all look like? Pretty good. Yet everybody confused down on pit road. As soon as you took on four, the rest of the front running teams really had to toss the dice whether to go with two or four. Were you playing a little bit of tricks on their mind as well? No, you know, our team got them out real quick and we knew we had to wait on the fuel anyway, so uh, we didn't lose much by taking old four and I think we learned a little something too. Have you chosen your last set of tires to hold back yet, Richard? We're still working at it. It depends on what the track's like in another 30 or 40 laps. Well, that's the story from Richard Childress's pit. He's got everybody scratching their head down here. <laughs> well, that learned a little something. A lot of folks would like to know what that is, but that, that little something oftentimes is the difference between first and third or fourth, or sometimes it's 25th. The interval between first and second, right at eight seconds right now, as Earnhardt has led 174 of the 222 laps that we have completed. Parsons continues to hang right in there. Now, all these guys are still running on the lead lap, so resolution is a ways down the road. No, I did it! I did it! Did what? I just invented the wheel! Uh, may I make a suggestion? Sure! Try these. What are they? Monroe Gasmatic Shocks. Oh. They'll give you the best ride ever. 25 of the 328 laps required for the Atlanta 500. They're your top five. Earnhardt, Earnhardt, Earnhardt. He has just dominated this race today in much the same manner he did so many times a year ago. And uh, he just simply has the muscle car. Benny Parsons is running in second place, so let's put a clock on him and see where they are as we come to 100 laps to go. 228 complete. And the interval now between first and second, 4.1 seconds. That can't be right, guys, because it was... It's, uh, it was eight seconds a minute ago, and I know uh, unless Benny's got a load of laughing gas, he ain't going to pick it up that quick. No, it's uh, Earnhardt continuing to pull away. It's uh, riding low in the car, working so well in turn. See the shadows now up in turns three and four. Earnhardt comes out of the shadows and comes by. Uh, this time, uh, Earnhardt uh, turning a lap, a uh, pretty good lap, 162 miles an hour. We're 229 laps into the race, so that car running awfully well here, even late in the race. Now we're getting to the point of the day, too, uh, uh, Dr. Jerry Punch, where that sun and visibility is becoming a factor up around turns three and four. Indeed it is, Keith. A number of the drivers have said they just complained about it. There's not much you can do about it, uh, as uh, we'll take a look at Neil Bonnet in a few minutes. When you're coming down the backstretch, uh, down in turn three, you look across toward turn four, and all you've got is uh, a sun glaring into the windshield. Here's the interval as Earnhardt comes by, and we'll see how far back Benny Parsons is. Should be around eight, maybe a little more than eight and a half seconds. Well, 8.4 seconds. So uh, Parsons back 8.4 seconds from Earnhardt and uh, just losing more and more. There's, there's the inside the windshield from Neil Bonnet's car, and they're heading through the corner, and the sun is not quite low enough 
as Bonnet comes motoring through to get that glare. But uh, Neil Bonnet's certainly off the pace. They had that problem earlier on. They lost a cylinder, and they're just trying to finish, trying to keep some of those points up and not lose so much time. He's going down the back stretch, and he'll head for turn three, and you will see the glare now climb up across the windshield. The glare, as you see, you can hardly see in front of you. See the glare on the windshield for a few seconds at 160 miles an hour. You don't know where you are. Well, you, you also, you're getting some oil on your windscreen. You're, you're, it's getting pitted because uh, you, you're not going to run out there with without something flying up and, and battering it. And so as the day wears on, uh, the more difficult it becomes. So uh, it's, 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 it's something to remember because, uh, and I, I probably over the years, I think you find that uh, that has been a contributing factor in some instances where wrecks have been involved uh, in, in turn four. That's Earnhardt coming down. I mean, that's uh, Bonnet coming down the back stretch, and you will see the cameras pivot around again, and there he is in turn three. That will get worse and worse as the afternoon progresses. Now, as we put the camera in the car, and we were visiting uh, with Neil Bonnet about it, and uh, he had uh, these adventures of his own from this particular area of the track. Well, I'll overemphasize that for you. Going in the third turn, you see you're going in the third turn where you're going. We've got about 200 yards of total line that's coming out the corner. I put two sets of goggles on. I put double thickness shields. I've tried everything in the world. But if it's sunny and that sun's shining over that fourth turn, when I go in that corner, I always go in back straight away. As I go in three, I look across the corner to make sure there's nothing happening over there. And then I, I know there's a little white line on the bottom. And all I do is just follow that white line. If there's a wreck coming off that corner, you're going to be in it. Hopefully, I always try to wait till the last minute before I get in the sun to glance across and make sure it's clear. And then I'm full throttle standing in the gas hoping nothing's happened before you get there. So there, there's been times at this racetrack I've ran blind off that corner for 200 laps. I mean 200 miles, you know, with stuff on the windshield, the sun shining in there. You just virtually can't see. And if they look through that camera time or two during the day and the sun's shining, they're going to say, well, there's a little blur. We've got a blur in the camera we couldn't see for a minute. Well, that blur is there for long, all day long for me also. Well, Neil got caught in a multi-car wreck there in 1978. The car was wrecked, and he got knocked unconscious and took a knob home with him. But uh, it's, it's tricky. It just happens to be the way things worked out because they laid out the track uh, in such a way they thought was the best. And uh, as the sun goes down, of course, in many instances, a lot of the uh, NASCAR events are held earlier in the day. And uh, when you get certain circumstances like this, so then it changes the rules a bit. Would you call that a three roll eight stop? I think I would, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 240 laps. 39 showing on our graphic here because it takes a second or two to make it. Nine leaders, 19 changes of the lead. The most dominant leader is Ben Dale Earnhardt. The cautions have been at a minimum today, only five, covering 30 laps, average speed, well under the track record of 144 plus, and 14 cars are gone. We have six cars on the lead lap, all pursuing the black one, number three, Richard Petty now in the pits. And it's one of those confounding moments for him because the hood is up. And when the hood comes up, it really bluntly means that you have passed the point of being competitive. Richard was being shown back in ninth position, a lap down on the leader. And now with the sun schedule stop, apparently they have taken the breather off. Dale Inman there in the hood compartment. There's Richard's young son, Kyle Petty. Kyle running in fifth, Walter running in fourth. That's a good battle in the racetrack as they're trying to go around the Sterling Marlin car. Marlin's car there just to the left of your screen, the 44 car. Sterling Marlin not being shown among the leaders. And of course, Walter trying to hang on to that four spot. Well, the Woods brothers and the people that own that car that Kyle Petty's running in fifth place right now. And of course, that's a, that's a legendary name in NASCAR racing from 1967 through 77. Uh, Leonard and Glenn and, uh, and all of the Woods brothers. Uh, Delano is no longer with them, a happy one. But uh, they took a lot of cash home from uh, the Atlanta racetrack. Over that 10 year period, they won six Atlanta 500s. They finished no worse than third in 11 straight races here. That'll buy you a lot of firewood in Virginia. Well, 
everybody in the world knows that this this is a commercial sport. I mean, all you have to do is look at a car, right? Everything's all over it. And the most commercial guy out there is this fella, Darrell Walton. Why is he commercial? Well, let's ask him. I think I recognized early on I got a lot of publicity. It was all bad, but I got a lot of publicity. <laughs> and I think I realized early on that uh, the power of the press has a lot to do with uh, a lot of things. And uh, I wanted to be a friend of the press and wanted them on my side when I go to bat with the people up in the tower or the people out on the racetrack. I wanted them to kind of side up with me. In doing that, uh, I've had the opportunity to sit in many, many uh, situations like we're in right now and, and tell my side of the story and uh, like a man told me one time give me 30 seconds one-on-one -on -one, that's what I'm looking for well he's won 71 times and there was a fellow on the plane the other day involved with those who signed the checks for some of that commercial advertising and wanted to make sure that the word got passed down to Daryl now win one <laughs> because he hasn't plucked one out of the tree in a while but he is a gamer you know, Darrell left Junior Johnson a couple of years ago. In fact, at the end of last year or the beginning of 87, he went to work for, for Rick Hendrick uh, driving that uh, bright orange car number 17. And while he was with Junior, you know, Waltrip is the leading money winner of all time. In his 19 years of racing, he has won uh, $7.94 million in 71 wins, as you said, Keith. And uh, with Junior Johnson, those six years, they won three Winston Cup championships, and he won 43 of his career 71 races. Let me update you. He's passed eight million. Because this year he's won 97,340, and that uh, made him the first man to go past eight. It's a sizable chunk of cash there. Uh, not bad. It's not quite as much fun, probably, as wearing pretty clothes and, uh, and hitting a golf ball and chasing it and hitting it again. But uh, nonetheless, it is. The one that he prefers, and this is Rusty Wallace, currently in the third position and running a very strong race. Rusty Wallace is a young man who has not been able to nail down a win on one of your super speedways. He's had some luck on the road courses and other places. And uh, we talked to Rusty about the problem to go with not winning on the speedway. I actually feel like I almost, almost already have won Super Speedway races because I've been so close so many times, but yet so far away. I've uh, led uh, the World 600 up to 12 laps to go and had a half lap lead. Uh, thought I had that thing in the bag. The Michigan 400, the Pocono 500, uh, the list goes on. It, it, we could have won seven races last year. We cracked oil pans or blew an engine or something like that. But uh, uh, we were fortunate enough to pull off two, uh, two wins last year, both on the road courses, and we tested a lot at Watkins Glen, and I think that helped us, but then we'd, uh, we ran real good out at uh, Riverside, California also, and was able to pull another one off. You know, Rusty the, Wallace. During the off-season, they thought about switching makes of cars, Keith. They uh, actually built a Ford and brought it here to test, and uh, decided, well, the Pontiac's gonna run awfully well in the 88, and they decided to stick with Pontiac, and they have been doing quite well here. One of the things that you find out about yourself uh, in this particular sport is uh, when you get slammed, and here he comes down pit road now, so he's got to come into the pits. He took that big tumble in 1983 at Daytona when he flipped, flipped and flipped six times. But he walked away from it and still had the appetite, and he's still going, and Jack Aroon is there watching the work in his pit right now. Well, Rusty Wallace has come in. They've added one tank of fuel. They're adding the second tank, and he's off and away. Kind of a somewhat unscheduled pit stop for Rusty Wallace. Barry Dotson is the crew chief on but Rusty, although it was a 12-second stop, kind of an unscheduled one, Barry. Not really. Our gas mileage is down. We didn't want to take a chance. You know, we ran out last week. It was scheduled. It's just a little too early. When you've got a problem like that, you've got to really hope for someone else's misfortune in front of you if, if you have any hope of winning this thing, though. Well, you got to hope the man upstairs wants you to win the race. That's what you got to hope. Well, I hope that he smiles on him today because he's got a problem with fuel consumption. Yeah, you ran 54 laps between the pit stops. And remember, there are no carburetor restrictor plates on the cars here on this mile and a half uh, raceway which means that they're sucking up more fuel than they would if they had had the restrictor plates in the carburetors. But it also means they're running faster. 
than they would have too. But still, it, uh, having to jet the engines a bit differently for this particular racetrack and having very cool, comfortable uh, conditions, uh, they are all sort of in a guessing game as to the absoluteness of their fuel consumption. But so far, nobody has run out of gas. But I remember back in around 73 or somewhere back in there where Bobby Allison won this race in 1972, I'm correct, that uh, he ran out of gas, coasted over the finish line, and squeezed out by a whisker of victory. We'll be back with more of the Atlanta 500 after this commercial and a word from your local stations. Zip. Lap 251 of a scheduled 328 for the Atlanta 500 Winston Cup Series NASCAR stock car racing. Dale Earnhardt has hit the pits, given up the lead, but he took on four new tires and was out and gone in just over 22 seconds. Benny Parsons is again the leader with Darrell Waltrip second, Kyle Petty third, Bobby Allison four, Dale Earnhardt. Well, Earnhardt just went by Allison a moment ago, so he probably has bounced back into the four spot. So right now we have uh, six cars running on the same lap, or is it seven? It's seven cars now on the lead lap. Out of the race today, a uh, list of cars, attrition now. We haven't had any bad wrecks. We've had some bangers, but nothing really serious. Maybe the, the toughest one involved maybe Allison early on in the race when he hit the wall over by turn two. Those are the cars now out of the race at 259 laps on this mile and a half true oval in Hampton, Georgia, but outside the city of Atlanta. The posted prize money for the event, over a half million bucks. And Betty Parsons, who has been a long time gone from Victory Circle, has run a very strong race today and has been constantly in the shadow of the real muscle car on, in today's race, that being the black number three Chevy of Dale Earnhardt. And Parsons should be getting ready to come down pit road probably next time by. He is just about to the limit of his fuel mileage, and if he stretches another lap or two, he may be coasting here in Atlanta. And of course, that's something you don't want to do if you got a shot to get a good finish. And here is where he won his last race back in 1984. Well, it was interesting that the Earnhardt people now convince uh, Richard Childress that uh, they do have the muscle car. They, the last two pit stops, they have put on four new shoes. So they don't seem any doubt in their mind that they can go out there and run anybody down. No doubt about that. And they are waving the pit board as Parsons came by that time. And apparently Parsons will signal them and we'll watch for him to make an entry onto pit road. They're waiting to pit road is clear that some of the other lapped cars have made pit stops and moved back out. So they won't have a problem with traffic getting the car in to get it fueled and get the tires changed. And they'd also would like to get a caution flag so they could come in and get four tires themselves without losing a lot of ground to Earnhardt. All right. Now we just saw a moment ago where Rusty uh, had to come in at 54 laps and get two tanks of gas. Uh, Betty Parsons now has gone 58 laps since he last stopped for fuel. And that means if he goes another four or five, he's in that 62, 63 lap range. And that's uh, that's pretty good mileage. That's excellent mileage. 60 laps here is 90, a little over 90 miles. And so if he can run, uh, if he can run four or five more laps, he, uh, he might be able to make it on this one final pit stop. It would be awfully close with the gas mileage. We're looking at 328 laps and uh, our total here at the Atlanta 500. We're showing 262 laps in the book. So uh, we're only about uh, 68 laps in the conclusion, making 67 now. So if he can go a few more laps, he might be able to get by. Well, somewhere along the way, you do have to take a considered risk, don't you? Whether it involves uh, working your way through traffic or whether it involves a decision regarding tires and or fuel. Now, you remember last year at the Firecracker 400, it was Bobby Allison's decision to take on four new tires. That's how he won the race. And uh, here you've got uh, Benny Parsons. You know, you, you, all, you know that Dale Earnhardt's going to have to make another fuel stop, right? Yeah, he's got to come in. Earnhardt's right. going to have to make a pit stop with about 10 or 12 laps to go. And if uh, Parsons can run it so that he has, uh, let's say, 60, 61 laps by the time he takes on his fuel, then, uh, you know, that's one of the considered risks he can take. Isn't it? If Parsons can run one more lap after this one, he will have to go 62 laps to the conclusion. He will have run 61 laps. So uh, if I were him and I had won in about uh, four years in Winston Cup competition, I think I'd gamble. Well, 
Let's see what they decide to do. Jerry Cappins is standing by in the pits, and uh, this might be. He's slowing, Keith. He has run out of fuel that in turn one. They tried to stretch it too far, and Benny Parsons has rolled the dice right. and come up short. Son of a gun, they have run out of fuel going into turn one. If they had come by that lap and pitted, they still might have been able to make it. Now, Parsons will lose a lot of valuable time coasting around. He is helpless there. The car is not running. He is out of gas. Well, you roll them, and sometimes you lose. Sometimes you win. And Dale Earnhardt now is going to put a lap on him. Parsons is dead in the water. He's just coasting around, coasting around, and every indication is that he did run out of gas. So they tried to squeeze that one lap too many, and they are paying dearly for it. You can't really blame that team either, Keith, because, you know, it's it's the fact that they realize Earnhardt has the strongest horse here in the field, and that they weren't going to be able to run with Earnhardt, and the only shot they had was to try to make it on this final field stop. Now the problem will be if they can get the car refired. Once you run out of fuel, the, the car will tend to have vapor and it will not be able to fire that well. So they're servicing the Benny Parsons car and Jerry Gaffins is there. Well, Jerry, they did get the car fired again and now it stopped. Now they got it refired. Just as you said, the fuel lines needed to get a little bit of fuel back in them. Doug Raggart, the crew chief, very disappointed. He watched as Benny Parsons went into turn turn one without any power and he stomped his foot. It was a gamble. He thought might win the race, but obviously it, it didn't pay off and Benny Parsons goes back out. 27 seconds pit stop for Benny Parsons, and it's an unfortunate break for this likable team. And as you can see now, Doug Reich gambled, lost, but that's part of this business, Keith Jackson. Yeah. Well, it's, it's one of those things you want to throw your hat down and stomp it, isn't it? Because it was so close to being really lucky. Yeah, that would be freely translated if they had gone on to win the race. Brilliant, right? Outstanding. It went off in their hands. It didn't work. That goes to show you the most important piece of equipment in, on pit road is not a jack or a gas can. It's a little calculator they use for fuel mileage. And sometimes gut feeling. It says, let's do it or let's don't do it. And, uh, that time didn't work. So, Betty Parsons. Balls a lap down. Dale Earnhardt, your leader, followed by Daryl Waltrip, Kyle Petty, Terry Lombardi, and Rusty Wallace. Bobby Allison is also now a lap down. And uh, Brett Bodine is now a lap down. Uh, Brett just coming off pit road. They had a lengthy stop there, getting some tires changed and put on his car. Making his way back on the speedway. But there's Earnhardt. Bobby Allison's in the pits. Stop. 20, almost 24 seconds for Bobby Allison. They changed four tires on Bobby Allison's car. There he is moving back on the speedway. He was a lap down. He will lose another lap to the leader. And here's a second place car. Darrell Waltrip coming down pit road. And Jeff Hammond and the crew will go to work on that car. Waltrip seems to be the only car that may have a shot at Earnhardt here as they are trying to get that final pit stop and they will go to work there. Bill Wilburn and right rear tire. Jeff Hammond and the crew changing those tires on the right side. We're watching that time on the Waltrip pit stop. Waltrip only having won here twice in the history of this racetrack. He has not won here in quite a few years. His last win coming at 82, driving for Junior Johnson. 15.5 seconds. That'll help him a lot. He but just but with that, that's right. Yeah, because uh, Earnhardt just went flying by. Now here's Jerry Gaffins. Doug, did you think it was that big a gamble when you were going to do it, keeping Benny out there? Well, we knew we had to go to an X amount of laps to finish the race. We had run that many laps before, and I was, as he was coming by, I was getting ready to call him in, but he had run out. Uh, evidently, he was running the car just a little harder than we anticipated, and that's just one of those gambling breaks. What do you do from here now? Just hold on for the rest of the race? We're going to have to run that much harder to make up some ground. Right now, I believe we're one lap down. I'm not real sure. Now, is that your call, Benny Parsons' call, or Judy Dunlop's call on staying out? It's a pits call. We had to go to the certain amount, you know, we was trying to finish the race. That's just a gambling error. Maybe next time it'll work, right? Hopefully it will. Okay, that's a report from Benny Parsons' group. Terry Labonte and Junior Johnson's group, uh, they handled him in just under 14 seconds for car number 11 stop. So Labonte now is third, Kyle Patty is second, Rusty Wallace four, Darrell Walter five, Schrader, Allison, Parsons, all a lap down. You got the 
cars and drivers who have led during today's race, but the bulk of the leadership has been owned by Dale Earnhardt, and he's still in front. As a matter of fact, there are only two cars right now running on the lead lap, Earnhardt and number 27, Rusty Wallace. And Ricky Rudd's uh, mount is apparently picked up a stone and is gone for the day. They're rolling it toward the garage area to get it out of the way. And uh, Earnhardt now is out for a Sunday afternoon drive. The way it looks, there's a difference of almost 21 seconds between first and second. Lipton International Players Tennis Championships, one Eastern and Pacific, 12 Central Time next Saturday on ABC Sports. That'll be followed by the Pro Bowlers Tour out of Peoria, Illinois with $150,000 for the bowlers. And then ABC's Wide World of Sports will have World Cup skiing. You'll see Tomba, La Bamba, Zerbergen uh, looking for the World Cup title. And we'll have the feature on the Iditarod sled dog race from Alaska. Lynn Swatch went up there. I, wanna, I can't wait to talk to him when he gets back. There's your leaderboard. And you see that Wallace and Earnhardt are the only two on the lead lap with Waltrip, Petty, and Parsons all one down. And of course, we have fully documented the story of the gamble taken by the Benny Parsons crew, and they lost. Attitude is a very important thing, no matter what sport or what, what you're doing, period, whether you're working or playing. Is the matter of attitude, tenseness? Dale Earnhardt has this comment. Yeah, there's tense moments, but uh, on the whole, I'm relaxed. Uh, I don't, I don't get tensed up, and you can think quicker and uh, make better decisions when you're laid back, you know, thinking and instead of real tense and got your mind on something else. And uh, uh, some of the guys tense up too much, and uh, that's when they get in trouble. Well, he really hasn't been in trouble since the decision backfired on the Benny Parsons crew. It looked like they were going to come out of that thing with an advantage because we know that Earnhardt has to make one more pit stop. He cannot finish the race. In fact, there's nobody out there, I don't think, in a contending posture, including those who are a lap down, who can finish, unless, of course, when Earnhardt makes his pit stop, Parsons unwinds himself and has enough fuel Possibility that uh, Darrell Waltrip and Kyle Petty, with their late pit stops, may be able to go the rest of the way. But, you know, those cars are a lap down, as you said. Only Rusty right. Wallace and Earnhardt. So Wallace definitely can't make it. He pitted even before Earnhardt did. That's right. Here's Jack Aroot with more on it. And I'm with Richard Childress, the crew chief and car owner for the car. Richard, when will you bring Dale Earnhardt in for that last and final pit stop? We'll bring him in sometime when we know we can make it on one can of gas at that point. Will you wait? Will you run the string down as far as you can, or will you just try and bring it in as soon as you only need 11 gallons? We'll just bring him in when we know we can make it with a 9 or 10 gallons. We want to be safe on both ends. Well, I guess when you've got a lead like Earnhardt's got, you can play it safe just a little bit. But let me tell you one thing about lap times. They're not playing it safe with that. Dale Earnhardt has not backed out of the throttle at all. In fact, he's running just as strong as he was 100 miles ago. And that's bad news, not only today for the rest of the folks, but bad news uh, down the road. Eddie Beerswale has kissed the wall coming out of four, wasn't it? Beerswale, yes. Just touched it in car number 23. And uh, that rattled him around some. How much it impacted his car, you can't tell from this point, but he dropped down out of the way and is... Uh, He'll be slowly coming down the pit road. Yeah, I'm uh, sure he will. Car number 23. You know, we mentioned about one can of fuel when Jack Root was talking to Richard Childress, the car owner for Earnhardt, and uh, each of those cans hold 11 gallons. The fuel cell in these Winston Cup cars will hold 22 gallons of, of gasoline. So you figure if they go 60 laps on a full tank of fuel, they'll go 30 laps or about 50 miles, or roughly uh, 45, 50 miles here at Atlanta on one can of gasoline. So they'll have to go. It's a 328-lap race. Uh, 30 laps would be 298. So anytime, anytime after 298 laps, Earnhardt can come in and pit and need only one can of fuel. 
Well, he kissed up the right front of the car pretty well, but it, it looks like the tire's still up, isn't it? So it's probably, yeah, it is. It's rubbing now, and it's going to start to shred, and, and uh, you got to get it off of there. So it's a bit of bad luck for the young man from San Antonio, Texas. Right now, Dale Arn Earnhardt has control of this car race. But there is that element, as I've said three times now, of racing luck. You never know until it's over. Well, we mentioned last year that Ricky Rudd won this race but, and never led the entire afternoon until the final seven laps of the race. He took the lead on lap uh, uh, 322 and led the final seven circuits. Put the clock on him. He is going to have a substantial edge over Rusty Wallace, the only other man in the same lap. A little bit of deja vu here. Remember Wallace's first run ever in a NASCAR race came here in 1980, driving for Roger Penske in a Chevrolet. Wallace finished second all afternoon. He was chasing one guy who won the race. That was Dale Earnhardt. Currently, that's where we stand. Earnhardt at the leader and Wallace again in second spot. See how far Wallace is behind him. He comes out of turn four, comes by the flag stand there, 24 seconds flat. That is a bunch. Particularly to someone like Earnhardt. Let's talk about fuel in the Wallace pit now with Jerry Gappins. The team owner Raymond Beetle and Raymond, 24 seconds. Can you make that up on this last stop you got to make anyway? Well, we think we can. We're going to have to come in and make a quick gas stop, and hopefully this Kodiak Pontiac will be right there with him at the end. When will your stop come? You going to wait before Dale stops or after? How are you going to work it? No, I think we're going to have to stop about 12 laps before the race is over. And how do you think you can make up 24 seconds on a 32-second track? Well, we're just hoping for a caution so we can get closer together, but so far there hasn't been a caution in a long time. Well, there you hear from Raymond Beetle. A caution would sure help Rusty Wallace's situation out there on the track, Keith. All right, there's Rusty Wallace, uh, but there's a bigger story developing out there. It looks like Benny Parsons uh, has got an another problem. He ran out of gas a little while ago, and now he has lost power on the back straight, and seemingly is coasting through turns three and four. Well, Keith, he's coming back up with a little bit of power, but apparently uh, our estimations, what we are told, is maybe he may have lost a cylinder or two and maybe running on six cylinders, certainly under, under speed from what he was running a yes. few laps ago. There's no punch in it at all. So he has dropped down a bit and apparently is destined not to be a competitor over the final moments of the Atlanta 500. As we come back, Richard Petty has had bad luck bite him. May well have cooked an engine. That brings out the yellow. You race to yellow. Now, this might impact some folks who are lap down. Wallace will close up. That's a break for Rusty. Walter, Petty, Labonte, Parsons all looking to unwind themselves. Earnhardt just crossed start finish line. I don't think the other people are able to, they were not in position to do anything about it at that particular point in time. So Rusty Wallace, pit crew, gets the break it was looking for at lap 297, 328 to go 500 miles. And so under the NASCAR rules, you close up when there is a yellow. And Richard Petty looked like he blew an engine, dropped some oil, at least they will certainly check it before they let him continue racing. And if that means Petty is out of it now, that'll be 17 cars out and 25 still running. And Richard Petty's winless string continues, 104 races he's, uh, since he last won at Daytona back in 84. Here's Earnhardt on pit road. Now he can take two, two cans of fuel. He can take all he needs. He only needs one can. They got about, uh, they will 298 laps now. They got 30 laps to go. It'll be a shootout, and as you said, a break for Rusty Wallace because he will get the chance to take on four fresh tires, as will Earnhardt's crew. Rusty Wallace now coming in off the turn, uh, 
Four coming down Pit Road. Heavy traffic. There's Brent Bodine in front of Wallace. Dave Marcus. That's Labonte's car moving by. Wallace getting blocked in somewhat of a moving pick. And now Earnhardt has already finished his pit work, and he will pull out almost in front of Wallace. Yes, he will get in front of Wallace. Rusty lights up the brakes there, and now comes to a skittering halt in his pits. And his crew, Barry Dotson, Jimmy Maycar, and the crew will go to work changing four tires on the car number 27. All right, now Earnhardt took two cans of fuel. So fuel situation for him is utterly secure. There's one can for Wallace. Second can for Wallace. So he's going to be secure as far as fuel. Earnhardt is back out on the track. Under the yellow, Wallace will be able to close right behind him. Now the question is, has fate stepped into this circumstance and uh, done something to the Earnhardt car? If not, there just seems to be too much muscle there. Now let's go to Jack Aroon. Keith, you're never satisfied, even if you're the leader, and that's the case with the leader's pit. Dale Earnhardt, led by Kirk Shelmerdine, who's the crew chief, and Richard Childress, the car owner, they made a chassis adjustment that last time, put on four new sticker tires. You've heard them talk about them all afternoon, and they've made their choice. We should not see them back on pit road again, but they've made a minor chassis adjustment in the back of the car, hoping to give them just a little bit more bite to get ready for the last few laps here. So you're never satisfied. You're always searching, searching, looking for that little bit more, even though you might have 28 seconds of advantage under green flag conditions. How about you, Jerry Gappins? You were down there in the 27 pit. What did they do? Well, they, they mimicked Dale Earnhardt's uh, pit stop with new tires and worth Barry Dobson, the crew chief. And Barry, did you make any adjustments to the uh, to the car or changes in the tire stagger? Tire stagger a little bit, no adjustments other than that, you know. He's been beating us on the restart and got 30 laps to go. And, uh, Kodiak Pontiac is going to have, have to give it his best shot. You're asking for this yellow flag. You got it. Now you're going to be able to do anything with Earnhardt? <laughs> well, time will tell, you know. We'll have to get better to beat him, you know, or he'll have to get worse to lose. Why is he beating you on restarts so bad? I don't know. You know, our car's been a little tight. That's the reason we changed the tire stagger. Okay, they got the brake they're looking for. Now it's up to Rusty Wallace and Dale Earnhardt out on the track to settle it, Keith Jackson. All right, if you, uh, if you change the stagger a bit, you hope you've made the right decision. If you go for more bite again, you hope you have made the right decision. I think Earnhardt, in Earnhardt's situation there, his crew chief saw the fact that an engine was blown over in turn two, and there's a lot of oil over there, a lot of oil dry. That'll make the track very slippery. There's also about 300 laps worth of rubber on the racetrack, which makes it even more slick, so they don't want to take a chance. The Earnhardt will go barreling into the corners as fast as he's still running here late in the race, and the rear end of the car will come around on him, so they tighten the car up a little bit, jack the little wedge, or that means a little more weight in that left rear tire, so it'll rip the asphalt going into turn. Yeah, but did you see what Rusty did there, you know? You're entitled to go back to your, your your, uh, your position and he came whipping around on the outside and slid himself and he just went right up his tailpipe and he's sitting now right behind Dale Earnhardt but again the thing you have to consider is the fact that uh, uh, Walter he's, he's uh, kind of creeping in the middle there a little bit but he's not entitled to uh, he has to start on the inside he's a lap down and the NASCAR rules say that when you get the inside. one lap to go signal from Harold Kinder you can close up all the cars in the lead lap on the outside that means those two cars there and the lap cars on the inside. So Walter wanted that inside post position so he'd have a shot at possibly getting in front of Earnhardt. If a caution flag were to come out this first lap, maybe when Walter was in front of Earnhardt, he'd get back in the lead lap. Well, that's the only chance he's got. He's got to have enough punch in his car now to, uh, to get past Earnhardt. In other words, unwind himself because he is a lap down. Now, if he is able to get through turn one and get on in front of Earnhardt, and then he'll be on the same lap, and then who knows what could happen. But uh, the green flag comes down, and Earnhardt goes blazing into turn number one. And he's just running away from Rusty Wallace right now. Earnhardt fires the afterburners on that restart. I mean, he pulled them away 10 car lengths, and Waltrip had a pretty good start, but uh, he may be a problem for Rusty Wallace. Wallace trying to catch Earnhardt, but now he has the lap car of Darrell Waltrip in between them. Wallace looks for the low groove, but Earnhardt is there, and he won't give it up. And Earnhardt now is once again in the catbird seat. It doesn't just happen. First off, you have the team effort, but then you got to have a guy out there sitting behind the wheel who understands the circumstance, knows what he's doing, and uh, has enough courage to go ahead and do it. And right now, he is just blistering the back straight and threatening to bury Rusty Wallace. Walter
trip in that red car, the orange, bright orange car there in second place, as it would appear on your screen, is actually a lap down to the leader, Earnhardt, and the car immediately behind him, Rusty Wallace. And we are at 303 laps. Kyle Petty and Terry Labotti uh, lap down, but they're fighting right now for fourth place. Kyle Petty driving the Woods Brothers car. And the car they're going underneath there, the car number 25 of Kenny Schrader is actually being shown in two laps down in, in sixth position. So uh, Kyle Petty would be fourth, Terry Labonte fifth, and Schrader, the car on the outside there, would be in sixth spot. Earnhardt continues to pull away, pull away. Waltrip trying to hang on to him, but Darrell can't do it, a lap down. Rusty Wallace is losing steadily. You see the relationship of your the black car. Now the, the whiter car back there, that's the number two car, Rusty Wallace. And he, is, he has lost contact. That's Bill Elliott hanging on to Rusty Wallace there. Of course, Elliott uh, was never a factor today. A lot of people thought he may be uh, the man to beat here in his home state, uh, the hometown favorite from Dawsonville, not far up the road above Atlanta. But uh, he lost five laps early on with a distributor problem. So Bill Elliott's the guy we haven't talked about much today, but uh, he's five or so laps down. He got 23 laps to go, 22 and a half, actually. So it's just a matter of whether or not uh, Earnhardt has the luck because right now it appears that he has everything else. Talk about what kind of guy Dale Earnhardt really is. You know, during the offseason when uh, Neil Bonnet, who's probably one of his better friends on this circuit, uh, was ailing and Neil was so down about the fact that possibly his career and, and, and as a driver was over with that uh, grinding crash at Charlotte. Earnhardt uh, was able to sneak away and bow out of some personal appearances to go down to Neil Bonnet's house and, and uh, cheer him up a little bit. In fact, he grabbed him and said, you're not uh, you're not that bad off. Come on, we're going deer hunting. So they went out there and they strapped Neil Bonnet to a tree. And uh, I think it was the best therapy that you could have given Neil Bonnet to have his buddy Earnhardt, who had such a great year. And Earnhardt convinced Bonnet, said, look, now I had a good year this year. And a couple of years ago, it was Elliott. Maybe next year it'll be you, Neil. And son of a gun, if Bonnet hasn't won two of the first uh, four races this season. had a bit of a struggling day today but uh, his partner his buddy certainly had Bobby Hillen Jr.'s had a re relatively steady ride right now he is running in the number six position he's the second youngest uh, winner in NASCAR Winston Cup 22 years of age when he won the 1986 Talladega 500 Fireball Roberts was the youngest at 21 when he won one back in 1950 at Hillsboro North Carolina so here's Dale just standing on it, and wife Teresa watching. They live near Pinapolis, North Carolina. Teresa's originally from Conover, North Carolina, and uh, her father was a, a noted dirt track, uh, dirt track driver up at Hickory Speedway, Hal Houston, uh, uh, the father of Teresa Earnhardt now, and uh, of course, uh, Teresa's uncle Tommy Houston, a pretty well noted uh, Grand National driver over the years. So, Teresa is not only his wife, but his uh, supporter and his business manager. She works in the team shops and helps manage all the contingency award programs. 25 cars running. We're at lap 309. That shows 308 there because of the posturing of the leadership, and you see only two cars now. It was a very competitive looking field. Uh, actually, it was a competitive race through more than half until Benny Parsons ran into his bad luck. And since that time, Earnhardt has really taken over and is heading now for what appears to be his first win of 1988, following a season in which he made uh, a lot of money and had a lot of success. Well, for the second year in a row, he was voted driver of the year, of course, by the National Motorsports Press Association. And uh, in 86, he shared that honor with Tim Richmond. Last year, he won it all by himself and uh, received that coveted Richard Petty trophy. It's a beautiful trophy. And Keith, you, you got to understand, Earnhardt is 35 years old. And when he was growing up, he was worshiping people like Richard Petty and Kelly Arbor. And now he's out here racing against the media consistently. But when he, when he received the Petty Award at Charlotte back in January, he said, that's the highest honor 
I could have is someone like Richard Petty with all your wins and all you mean in stock car racing to stand here and shake my hand and give me that award. Well, this will be his 32nd win. And Jack Aroot now is with wife Teresa. Teresa, you play such a critical role in Dale Earnhardt's success. It's been a while since he's been to Victory Lane. Are you beginning to think about what it'll be like in there, or are you just trying to put those thoughts out of your mind in the waning moments of this race? No, I know what it'll be like. I'm just hoping that it's going to uh, get to that. You know, it's not over yet, and you never know till it's over. You really do watch. You work up in the scoring tower. You're, you're real close to Dale when it comes to what's going on under the racetrack. In fact, you're, you're wired into him by radio. What was he saying today? Could you pick up anything? He doesn't really say too much. I just listen so that I'll know if there's a problem, what the problem is. But uh, really, the only time they have much to talk about is when they're getting ready to pit or trying to make an adjustment or something. So I just really listen so I'll know what's going on. Has it been tough living with Dale in the fact that he hasn't won one yet? This, Although this is only the fourth race of the season, he won that clash race at Daytona, but he hasn't done much since then. Well, no, it's been just great, as always. But uh, we've been in contention for every race, actually. We've just had a little trouble with flat tires in two races while we're actually we're running for the win. So, no, it's not been bad at all. It's been great. It's been great, but it'll be a lot better in about 20 minutes if they go to victory lane. And right now he has a 3.43 second lead over Rusty Wallace. With Waltrip, Kyle Petty, Harry Lafonte, the next three pursuers, and they are all one lap down. And Benny Parsons now has dropped well back because Benny is, is nursing a lame steed. Probably running on five or six cylinders now. Well, Benny just trying to finish this race here. Earnhardt's last lap, about 163 miles an hour. And so he is not letting up much out there, but his car is bobbing a little bit. Remember that chassis adjustment they made on that final pit stop that Jack Aroot was talking about? They tried to tighten the car up. They knew these last few laps would be awfully tough as far as the track is concerned. The track is awfully slick. And they don't want a simple little mistake out there. Him to trying to get around a lap car, possibly a car sliding up into him. So he's being very, very careful, but still running laps over 160 miles an hour. right you just turn it loose and let it roam Paul Azinger had a dizzy spell yesterday but Paul came back today to win the Bay Hill Golf Classic so he fucking some bucks too everybody's making money except you and me Doug. <laughs> Jerry Gappins for a moment We've been talking about sticker tires all afternoon. And what a sticker tire is, it simply means it's a brand new tire with a sticker on it. As you see, Goodyear puts it on there. And the difference between a sticker tire and a scuff tire is a scuff tire has been used either in practice or early in the race and then saved back. But most of the guys today have liked to stay with the sticker tires, the brand new ones that Goodyear brought out. And they seem to be working well. And Goodyear, as far as his tire war is concerned today, they seem to want it with Dale Earnhardt. Bill Elliott has busted the wall over in turn two. So it's been another unkind day for the redhead from Dawsonville, Georgia. And we mentioned about how slick the track was getting, and that's one of the reasons the Earnhardt crew wanted to go with that extra wedge and extra tightening of the rear of the car down. And you see what's left of that uh, Ford of Elliott. He hit it a pretty good lick over there. The right front of that fender caved in. The car has scrubbed around some 200 to 300 feet and finally has come to rest just outside of turn, uh, to turn two, where we had that X on the screen at the beginning of the day. We predicted that would be a trouble spot, and it indeed has. All right, 318 laps. The Elliott car on the wall. That is the seventh caution flag of the day, and it's another break for Rusty Wallace. Because he pulled right up into the tailpipe of Dale Earnhardt. And now we'll just see how long they go before they turn him loose, you, it is possible, you know, to have a race finish under the yellow. Earnhardt to the pits, Wallace to the pits, Earnhardt stopping first. The crew's already got two tires off, now two tires on over in the Wallace pits. They're running a little late. The time here is on the Earnhardt pit. They're going for four new shoes. Take a look at the right rear of the car of Rusty Wallace. They really were jacking wedge. The guy had a, had a ratchet in his hand sticking through a hole in the window in the rear of the car. Earnhardt's car not down and away. Wallace's car down. Who can win that?
battle of pit road and Earnhardt will rush by him. There's Waltrip's car coming out of pit road. But Earnhardt, another good pit stop at a four tire. All right, change. now Waltrip got out in front of him, right? So that means Waltrip is off, uh, he has unwound himself? No, Waltrip didn't no. get out. He, he didn't quite get out in front of behind him now. Okay. 319 laps. We got nine to go. Ain't over yet. We'll be right back. That is Bill Elliott's proud bird from Dawsonville. Obviously something broke on the car or it dumped oil and took him right into the wall in turn two. And uh, the trucks are over there now to extricate it from that threatening posture with seven laps to go. As Soon as they can get the car off the track, it might well be if there's not a lot of oil spill that we will be able to finish the race under green. And they'll do, I'm sure, do everything they can. But you see oil now starting to trickle out from under the car and run down on the racetrack. Yeah, that's some moisture from the front of the car. We might mention Elliot did stay in the car for a period of time, and they are instructed by NASCAR to stay in the car and keep those seat belts buckled. And the reason being is if you blow an engine or something like that and put oil on the track, uh, even though your, your accident has stopped, someone else's accident may just be beginning. If they get in your oil, they can slam right into you. If you unbuckle those seat belts and get ready to get out, that could be disastrous. So Elliot is out of the car and apparently uh, appears to be okay. I guess he will be taken in for a little bit of a safety check uh, in the infield care center. It is indeed a bit of an untoward place for one to become a spectator. Bill Elliott just got out of the ambulance and walked into the care center on his own, so that's, uh, that's awfully good news. So he like walked out and had his hand on the side of one of those uh, paramedics there, and they will give him a check out. Maybe we'll get a comment from Bill before it's over. All right, we'll wait and see what the decision is. Their truck's back over there now with the Elliott car. And now they're going to try to push it, get it off the wall, I guess, so they can find a way to pick it up and carry it out. That's NASCAR control there, Keith. And uh, the gentleman on the left, uh, that's Dick Beatty, the director of competition. The fellow on the right, he's the coach, uh, one of the all-time all-Rams football players. That's Les Richter, vice president for competition and development for NASCAR. He wasn't too bad as Golden Bear either up at Cal. <laughs> and they're watching with those glasses over toward turn two where the safety crews are working on that uh, this car, the Elliott machine, and the car is wedged into the wall. You don't hit a wall at 160 some miles an hour and have it to, to bounce off. That wall didn't give much. Now the next question is, uh, what about uh, the oil? You see the one of the gentlemen there working on it uh, slipped a little bit, so we know there is some oil. Got to be some under there, and there you they're putting down the oil dry, trying to to get it out of the way. But fortunately, it did not much of it got down on the racetrack, did it? Don't really see much over there. In fact, you look into the corner, going into one and two, I don't see anything on the racetrack, and possibly maybe he just cut a tire or uh, something in the steering suspension broken in front of the car, and he went right under the wall over there. But uh, there is very very minimal. Let's don't look at Just push it down and let it sit. on the far left of your screen up in NASCAR. That's Ed sitting down on the left. He really runs the race for NASCAR. Dude, just take him in the hole wherever you sit. Just let him sit there. We get this thing finished. Jim Bachoven. You can drop in your hole back there. Uh, Tommy, where are you? Somebody's on top of you. Somebody's on top of you. Say it again. Okay, Grant. Gentlemen, more gentlemen more this here. makes that last pit stop, although it was under caution, that drag race down into turn one so ever important. Nobody thought it would take this long to unwedge that car out of turn number two. They thought they were going to get some green flag racing. We may end this under caution, and the pass for the lead may have taken place down here on pit road. That's true. We talked about it. We saw Earnhardt's car coming out, and he just was able to get out in front of Rusty Wallace's car. Of course, uh, Waltrip was there, too, but he is a lap down. So, Keith, uh, that, that could have been, uh, been one of the deciding factors. It looks like we're going to get ready to go back to green here. Yeah, Harold so. Fender just put up one finger, so it means one more time around, and uh, we will finish this one under green. That'll be 324 when they come around this time, so we'll have... We'll have either three or four laps under green. 
have to go to the race. So the next time around, they drop the green. So that'll be three laps. It, in a sense, is a drag race. Jerry Gappett. Barry Dobson, you changed four tires instead of two that last pit stop, and you almost got out in front of Earnhardt, but you didn't. Now do you wish that you maybe would only change two instead of the four to get back out in front of him? No, we'd have to have four to beat him. He used a moving pick on us getting in and kind of held us up, and uh, that's the only way we can beat him, you know. I told Rusty, said take one round to buy it out. We took a round and a half. I told him, I said, knock his fender in, just do something, man. <laughs> when he takes a round and a half out, that means he's loosened that car up, and it's in a race driver's hands at that time, Keith Jackson. Yeah, but it's a slick track. It's a considered risk again. Well, that could be serious. They took a round and a half a bite out of that car, Rusty Wallace. So he could go skittering sideways in the corner, but that's the only shot they have. Loosen the car up so it'll turn, run it wide open through those corners, and they're going to have about four laps to do it. Yeah, we're looking for green. Remember the last time we had the restart, so much power that Earnhardt was smoking his tires coming down off turn number four through the straight into turn one and he starts to get on it pace cars off here they come Wallace has got a problem with wall trip now he squeezes by Darrell and for the moment is hanging on to Dale Earnhardt but now it's just plain old-fashioned horsepower trying to take the low groove over there knowing the car should be might be a little bit loose and comes across the racetrack but Wallace's car gripping pretty well he's hanging on two laps to go Jr., Buddy Baker, Brett Bodine, and so forth. But the margin of victory, because of the caution flag, was less than a second. At 100 and, uh, what was it? 1.07, that's what it was. 1.07 seconds. Today, we're playing. We've got a very jubilant Dale Earnhardt. You just got out of the car, and uh, Dale, uh, first victory of the year. How does it feel? Feels great. You know, it, we'd uh, worked awful hard uh, Everybody's worried about this black paint job, GM Goodrich Parts uh, sponsor and everything, but uh, we came through. Uh, Kurt and Lou and Richard and all the guys, they just did a super job all day, and the engine ran super all day. We just, you hit on the comp combination. We had to make one little adjustment on the chassis, and you know, it just came back and repeated itself every time we started doing, doing them four tire stops and really got ahead of them. I think that put the icing on the cake. Not only did it put the icing on the cake, but I think it really messed with a lot of the crew chief's minds of the people that were chasing you, especially that first one in the green flag conditions. Well, that's true. Uh, you know, you got to set the pace sometimes. You got to make your own luck. You got to make uh, make your own breaks. And, uh, you know, Rich and I decided we'd go for broke this time. Let's see what happened, and it worked out. This team has been together for a number of years now. Does that account for a lot of your success, that communication that you can come up with an idea like that during green fly conditions and say, hey, let's try it? Well, I think, it, you know, the confidence is there, and that's the biggest thing, Jack. If, if you're confident that uh, you can do that kind of thing, uh, it'll work. And, you know, the guys are confident they're not going to make a mistake on their pits, and that's the biggest worry was, you know, the mistake on the left sides. And they just went off like clockwork, and guys did a great job. You know, you said before this race that you were 
so happy for the success of Neil Bonnet this year, your old hunting buddy, hunting buddy, and you, you know, you were out there down in Alabama all winter, and you hunted with him and said, hey, you can have some success like I did, and you said before the race that you felt that it was time for you to have a little. Well, it was. Uh, you know, it ran good here in practice and test, and, uh, you know, Neil's a tough competitor, but, I, you know, I want to get up there and race him and uh, beat him uh, when he's running at his best, not when he's having trouble like he did today, and, uh, you know, it, it, he, he did a good job in the uh, two races won this year, and you can see a lot more out of, of him this year, I guarantee you. Well, Keith, if I was the competition, I think I'd take up deer hunting. Back up to you. I tell you, I'd also talk to Lula Rosa, who is the engine builder for that group, because that was a powerhouse that Dale Earnhardt drove today.